Here we go. I hereby call Here the hearings for uh, the budget hearings for the public comment part of the budget hearings for FY21 for Wednesday, June 24th, 6 p.m. to order. Good evening, everybody. This is um. This is the public comment part of our budget hearings. We have, um, before we commence in reading them, I will read the governor's um, declared order for the open meeting laws. So please bear with me. So, out of, out of respect for public health and in response to the governor's declared state of emergency, this meeting will be closed to the public and interested parties can instead access the deliberations via a live stream, www.youtube.com slash user slash the Brockton channels slash live. This meeting is being held in accordance with Governor Charlie Baker's signed open meeting law order okay. dated March 12th, Councilors. Um, March 12, 2020, which relieves a public body from the requirement of Section 20 of Chapter 30A that it conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public, provided that the public body makes provision to ensure public access to the deliberations of the public body for in interested members of the public through adequate alternative means. So once again, good evening, everybody. Yesterday, um, we had some technical difficulties, so that's why we weren't able to start to right at 6 p.m. So um, that's why we extended it also to this evening. Um, we have received emails from the public, and our clerk this evening, Mel, will read um, the emails. We will also read comments from a YouTube Live that are being live streamed now. Um, but in order for you to, to read your comments, we did state that the um, you need to uh, state your name and Brockton address. You have to be a Brockton resident in order for us to read your comments. So with that being said, we will open up this part. And uh, Mel, could you please start with um, the emails, please? Ma Madam Chair, uh, just, for the, just for the record, I, I'd like to confirm that we did have someone check the technical difficulties. I understand they're all ironed out. Uh, am I correct? Sure. I mean, I, yes, they are all ironed out, but this part, um, we will test that once all the counselors are here for our hearings, yeah. but this is the public comment part, so as long as Mel's microphone's working, we'll be fine, and then we'll, we'll work on once we get all the counselors thank, here thank to make sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, please uh, start with the first email, Madam Clerk. Jeannie Holmes Corellas. Belcher Ave. First, this meeting is in violation of the open meeting law, and I am registering my protest of the meeting proceeding as well as any and all actions taken during this violation. There is no good reason that all the other municipalities can do the budget process openly and legally, yet Brockton fails to do so. Second, you need to cut the budget substantially across the board. You need to cut in every department. Cut the money <clears throat> for all raises and promotions. Cut all money for new or proposed city positions. Cut all funds for vacant positions. Cut all overtime across the board. Cut funding for Aquaria. Cut all salary budget requests by at least 10%. Cut all travel budgets. Cut all consultant fees, costs, and make as many other cuts as unnecessary of excessive requests as you can possibly make. Every year in December, you say how you worry about the taxes and how people will pay the increased tax amount, but this is a false face because the truth is you know you knowingly create the amount of taxes that you need to be distributed to residents and businesses when you pass the budget in June. If you fail to make the needed cuts now, please don't lie again to us in December or pretend you really care when you cause the problem by passing an excessive budget now. You will reap what you sow now. If you need more time, request it from the state. In light of the pandemic and the impact on Brockton, you are able to make a request for an extension according to House Bill 450-98, Section 6, enacted April 2nd, MGL Chapter 44, Section 32, permits extensions, and Senate Bill 2680 provides for a July 31st date and up to three one-month extensions. Please don't say or act like this is not an option. You should know it was enacted. 
don't do like last year, fail to cut enough and make mistakes, <clears throat> and then tell us half a year later that you should have paid more attention to all the details of the budget you passed in June. Learn from past failures and don't repeat your past mistakes with inattention to details and overspending money you don't have. Cut this budget so the amount of taxes needed to cover the budget will be less than you, and then you can give the taxpayers a break in December. Bring this novel approach to a year when people desperately need a financial break and a ray of hope. I would be glad to be more specific, but the time limitations you set here denies this opportunity. Thank you. Oh, before you go on to the next one, um, so I'm timing these. I, most of them are very short, uh, pretty short, but um, this, pa this last one that you just read just hit the two minute mark. So we did state to keep them in the two minute mark, um, just so we make it clear to everyone at home. Thank you, Mel. Laura Andrade, Warren Ave. The time allotment for public comments only being 30 minutes is not only unacceptable, it is unjust and in utter disregard to the voice of the citizens of the city. We demand to be heard. Defund the Brockton police. Sincerely, a concerned Brockton resident. Annabelle Santiago, May Ave. We need to make the budget process inclusive, accessible and fair for all Brockton residents. I stand in solidarity of the following statement. The disdain that Brockton local government has for its citizens is appalling. They won't even do us the courtesy of trying to hide their contempt, their complete disregard for our lives and overall well-being. 30 minutes for a city of almost 100,000 citizens is downright deplorable. We demand real community involvement. Defund Brockton Police, hashtag. Sincerely, a concerned constituent. Michael Morrison, Sophia Ave. I'm writing to let you know that this budget hearing process is not inclusive and represents systemic racism. Asking people to email is classist. Only those with internet access, a computer, and proficient English skills can participate fully. Also, I only knew about this from a friend. We, as citizens, have not been made aware of the budget, the process, or how to participate in a way that is inclusive. These methods that are quick and easy for you ignore a huge segment of our population. Many that are in the, that segment are African American. This is a systemic racism in action. Please change the way in which you are conducting this to include all of the people you represent and all of the people this budget will impact. Melanie Morrison, Sophia Ave. I'm writing in order to let you know <clears throat> that this process is deeply flawed. I am participating in this way because it's the only way I know of, but I know so many of our neighbors will be excluded. Asking people to email doesn't allow for those without internet or computer access, without proficient English skills, our youth, our elderly, and many others to participate in this important dialogue. I follow multiple pages on Facebook in order to stay informed as a citizen of Brockton, but I only knew about this from word of mouth from a friend. What happens if you receive more emails than can be read in 30 minutes? How does any dialogue happen by just reading emails? We are in an important movement where so many are waking up to injustices and have input about around how money should be spent in our community. I understand COVID creates limitations, but this feels like a sad attempt to just say that you did allow for input towards the budget hearing process when really it is ex exclusionary and insulting way to ask for input. It doesn't feel like you mean it. If you do care about creating systems that are anti-racist, then you must do better. Kevin Higgins, East Ashland Street. Here is my, good evening, here is my comment. The city of Boston has officially proposed redirecting 12 million, 10% from the police department to social services and new programming to amplify equity. In Brockton, we know that 24 educators and support staff in BPS have received pink slips, while racial disparities in education are widening. Students of color are disproportionately impacted by the school to prison pipeline and achievement gaps. We are saying at rallies and in public, yes, I stand with you, but this budget does not reflect any new or significant commitment to communities of color. A budget is a reflection of our values. Perhaps the council should consider reducing the overtime budget of the police station to, at the very least, not worsen the inequity 
of our public school system, as well as invest in community-based violence prevention programs with tried and tested measurable objectives and outcomes. Lastly, instead of handing away over $2 million in tax handouts to a dying industry, we should make a real investment in the minority-owned businesses that continue to build the city and are at risk of closing permanently. Thank you. Jose Tavares, Yolanda Drive. I am not represented. I walk around the city and everyone looks like me. <clears throat> Now a group of people who don't are deciding how I'm going to live my life. We need a new standard. Hashtag defund Brockton police. Michelle Ruse, Darren Drive. I'm writing to ask that the city council defund the police. This does not mean take away all funds. It means taking money away from the police budget and reallocating it to things like education, mental health services, affordable housing, etc. Police have way too many responsibilities that they should not have. They are playing the roles of social worker, substance abuse counselor, etc. The large budget they are given should be broken down and redistributed to help our community. Yeah. Joshua Romulus, 46 Cleveland Ave. My name is Joshua Romulus, 46 Cleveland Ave. I want you to defund the Brockton police and reinvest in public schools and social services. Our future deserves peace, not war. Thank you. Shaquilla Shoulders, Clinton Street. I would like for everyone involved to know that Brockton is a place filled with so many talented people. However, we lack resources that surrounding areas have. Growing up, we didn't have much besides the Boys and Girls Club, which was a great resource for us, but it's not enough. We deserve creative centers where children can learn a range of skills such as web design, photography, music, production, etc. We deserve trade programs that show the youth <coughs> Another way besides the norm, defunding the police and giving the resources back to the city is all we, are, we ask for. We deserve our educators to get paid a basic living wage. Our youth deserve their classrooms to not be so overcrowded. They are unable to receive the help for them to be successful, which is the bare minimum. Youth need to have a stable and supportive system in school and outside of school programs, as I mentioned previously. Without both of these, it makes it difficult for them to know there is so much more out there for them. Stop limiting our youth. Give our youth the same opportunities young people in towns like Newton, Cambridge, and Arlington have and imagine the possibilities. The youth are the future and investing in them is investing in a better future and Brockton. Vanda De Silva Barboza, Dover Street. The budget hearing process is not all inclusive. The additional money being proposed for the police and lieutenant should be reallocated to the following. One, a board made of Brockton citizens to oversee the police department. Two, programs that are making a difference and investing back to the Brockton community. A, mentoring programs in the community for kids and adults. B, summer programs slash camps. C, STEM programs. Three, to professional slash curriculum development. Four, to multicultural studies in the schools all year round. Thank you. Now, do you want me to take read some for you? Sure. Thank you. Michelle Roos, <coughs> um, Darren Drive. First, I would like to address the fact that the city council is requiring full names and addresses to be read aloud in public and put online in order for our voices to be heard. It is extremely irresponsible of the city to require this of its residents. We want to participate. We understand you need our addresses to verify that we have Brockton residents, but there is no need for them to be read aloud or to be posted publicly online. Pretty much anyone who uses the internet knows it's not a good idea to put your address online. Second, I'd like to ask if our questions will be addressed. Yesterday we were allowed to submit comments and questions, but then the meeting continued without addressing them. We want answers. Third, having this meeting without the public present is unfair. There are press conferences and events held outside City Hall all the time. Why can't we have the meeting out there so we can participate? This budget should not be approved until the public can actually participate. 
So I am going to answer this particular one because it addresses a lot of questions that are out there. Um, these budget hearings have always, in past years, and um, have always, we've allowed for public comment. It's not a public question and answer, but it, when City Hall was open, the public could come in before us and make their public uh, comments. So that's that's what we're allowing in reading um, your your um. comments that are coming in via emails or online. We, even if you were here in front of us, you would still need to state your name and address. That's with any hearing in this that's ever happened. As far as City Hall and government goes, you need, we need to verify that you're a Brockton resident. Um, as far as having the meetings outside, we've addressed this uh, in this particular question is, part of our um, charter state, one of the reasons we can have our open meeting laws is because we're live on cable and YouTube. So we can't be live being outside in, uh, outside in front of state, City Hall or out in a stadium. So this is, these decisions have been made after we have spoken to our law department, our um, city count, council's uh, attorney. We've spoken to them and we've been guided by them of how we need to deal with these uh, public hearings. So I hope that answers your question. Um, next email. Michelle Henson. My name is Michelle Henson and I live at 16 Ardsley Street, Brockton. I understand that we need some serious infrastructure work, like making sure streets don't collapse under trucks. I've been a homeowner and taxpayer in Brockton for 30 years. While I have zero construction training, I feel it's safe to assume that roads don't get like that overnight. Why weren't these issues addressed years ago? Definitely wish they were addressed before I retired and on a fixed income. Sincerely, Michelle Henson. Hi, how are you? My question is as follows. These are the ones I read. Page 231 states, the police department will continue the of a citywide community policing plan. Okay. I would like to know what this plan will entail. I would also like to know what developments have been made, implemented thus far, and what efforts are still being developed. These efforts should be itemized to allow for more transparency within the community. What is the timeline for which a thorough and complete community policing plan can be expected? That's Jahira Semedo, Moraine Street. Janae Perkins, Madrid Square. The state of the public education system in our city is incredibly concerning. For years we have seen a number of budget cuts in this area and the children in the community are suffering, suffering for it. Now faced with the challenges of COVID-19, our students will again be shortchanged due to poor planning by city officials. Now is not the time for additional cuts or layoffs, but rather to pump more funds into the education system to give our students a fair shot. The city needs to defund the police department, overtime, private details, special events, et cetera, and put those funds back into the city's department of education. We owe it to our students. Education is a right, not a luxury, and it's time to begin investing in our children. Alana Mendez Andrade, Lawson Terrace, to whom it may concern, the time allotment for public comments only be, being 30 minutes is not only unacceptable, it is unjust, and in utter disregard to the voice of the citizens of the city. Let us move towards funding schools that nurture the minds of our future. Let us invest more in the youth and their education system and less in protection. We must reallocate funds back into our community. We demand to be heard, defund the Brockton police, sincerely a concerned Brockton resident. Maria Taisha Lindsay, Sinclair Road. The budget hearing process is not all inclusive and not all encompassing. It is therefore unethical to hold a meeting concerning the budget for the city where the residents of said city is not present. Refund, refund the police. Best, Maria Lindsay. Fejans Lindsay, Sinclair Road. The budget hearing process is not all inclusive or all encompassing, defund the police. Paul Foos, West Elm Street. To the city councilors and mayor of Brockton, 
I am a longtime resident homeowner in this city. In this time of multiple emergencies, it is deeply disturbing that a business as usual budget is being pushed through in the usual way. COVID-19, the economic crisis, and a long suppressed movement against police brutality demand a sharp reordering of budget priorities. Please bring this discussion to a wider public before passing this flawed budget. The Brockton Police Department has shown this month that it is irresponsible and dangerous. They use excessive dangerous force against a peaceful, if exuberant, group. They deploy tear gas and carry assault rifles against young people with water bottles and fireworks. Our schools are suffering. Our social services are suffering. Brockton needs a civilian review board to reorder city services to offer true safety, assistance, and education, not violence and arrogance. The current police force do not make me feel safe as a citizen and taxpayer in the city. They nearly ran me down last July in a dangerous car chase down my street. The officers totaled their own vehicles and the teenage perpetrator managed to get caught on his own. Is this public safety? I would feel much better if Brocktonians had more education, social services, and volunteer and job opportunities. We are nearing a point where we vote out the self-serving, unrepresentative clique that dominates the city and its public jobs. Let us work toward that day unless real reform begins today. Sincerely, Paul Poos. My name is Nina DiFilippo, Peterson Ave. This budget hearing process is not all inclusive and not all encompassing. Defund the police. Rochelle Fanfill. This looks like a long letter, so we'll, um, this is the same letter that we read last night. So I'll read the first few minutes of it, two minutes of it. Divest, let me. Divest, detox, and defund, hashtag BPD. Divest definition, deprive someone of power, rights, or possessions, detox process or period of time in which one abstains from or rids the body of toxic or unhealthy substances. Defund, prevent from continuing to um, receive funds. Defunding the Brockton Police Department. Some call it defunding, but I call it detoxing of police department, which brings us to our connotation of defunding to us. Does not mean to no longer invest in the police force, but to stop funding sectors and portions in, in the body of a police agency. Our connotation of detox means to get rid of the unhealthy, aka bad cops in the community and replace them with the healthy, helping police, aka good officers. Our goals are not to abolish police officers, to put down <coughs> hardworking officers, take away pensions or council money from officers. Our goal is to invest the majority of the funding that goes to the police department and reinvest, reinvest it into the African American community. The community has spoken if these recent illegal activities against BPD, fake or exaggerated police reports, stealing arrested citizens' money, illegal tracing brats and citizens by hacking into their phones, police brutality, illegally using private information for wrong, wrong purpose, daytime harassment, corruption, prepper spraying, Conspiracy, I think they mean pepper spraying, but it says pepper. Conspiracy with uh, private societies, white supremacy, Freemasonry, Satanism, African American officers as well. They have an uh, undercover contract with the FBI, fire department, and local ambulance. Police are effective in reducing violence, crimes, and some say with budget cuts, defunding the police are likely inarticulate. I believe that that hit the two minute, and that was from Rochelle, Pamphield, Montello Street. So these are the emails, correct? We don't have any other emails. Oh, you got more emails? Okay, in between the emails, we're going to see what we have live, and let's see, we have a few comments on cable live. We have Nicole Coward, Gladstone Street, Brock, Brockton. Please read all unique letters just handed to City Ward 5 Councilman Jeff, Jeff Thompson. 
There are 20 plus letters. Yes, they are. He did hand them to me, but they're all individual letters. If I can't read each one, then we will at least read the names um, of the people who took the time to write them. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see. This. Okay. Bishop Tony Branch, uh, Montello Street. Hello is one of two elected representatives to the Southeastern Regional School Committee. I have read and support Dr. Lopes' submissions to the council. Rep. Tony Branch. I think those were the only ones I had. Yeah, addresses. So those are the ones that are on the YouTube live. I. Um, We have a, uh, an email from a resident that we're, we're getting these as we're in, so I've received, uh, this one was received earlier today. Dear Counselor Azak, my name is Richard Vivasto and I've lived in Brockton for 31 years. I understand that council members have been besieged by emails wishing the council members to defund the Brockton Police Department. This would dismantle the city. Without police, who do, who do you call for help? I strongly oppose defunding the police. I agree with City Council, Council Cardoso to have additional money budgeted for police diversity and inclusion and training. Brockton must stay committed to public safety. Thank you for reading my request. And that, that's from Richard DeVasto. Al, you still have more emails? Mm -hmm. So um, I know we did receive a lot of letters right now at the start of the hearing. So how many emails do you have there? Six. Okay, we have about three minutes, but we'll, um, I'm going to read just some of the names of the letters that were received outside. So we have Nada Wagner, Market Street, Michelle Roos, Darren Drive, Jed Resco, Center Street, Alana Burr, Perkins Ave, Ross DePina, Tucker Drive, Dario Center Street, Alexandra Texera, Henry Street, Lacey Francis Waldo Street, Charles Charleston Montfort, Manamet Street, Sarah Henry, Channing Ave, Janera Sameto, Moraine Street, and Angel Cosme. We don't have a street, but I, it's a Brockton, at, uh, Brockton PO Box. So those are the, we also have Joshua Resco Center Street and Eric McLaren Hilberg Ave. So these are all letters, um, and unfortunately we don't have the time to read all of them, but I will make sure that they will um, get put into the record. Do you have... It's 628. Can you send me some of the emails? Sure. Felicia Lotour, Douglas Ave. I'm a longtime resident of the city and I would like to express my concerns for our current budget allocations. As an active member in this community, I would like to see FY21 budget go towards what is needed in the city. Defund the BPD and allow those funds to be allocated to our education system infrastructure, public resources, and community centers. We demand to be heard from the Brockton police and clearly a concerned Brockton resident. Yes, Mr. Cook. When you have a chance to size it, I'd like to speak to you and take a slight reset. Sure. Have a question for you. Okay. Jose De Pina, Rutland Street. This cannot be called a public hearing without the public. The local government of Brockton are corrupt and racist. Reach me here, 774. 297-1178. Good, um, good afternoon, council members. This is Barbette Jocelyn, 31 Brunswick Street. After extensive research and more so after the deplorable display of force by the police tear gassing women and children, it goes without saying that the budget for the fiscal year 2021 in Brockton should focus on defunding and demilitarizing the police reallocating the funds to the communities such as education, social services, mental health, domestic violence, homelessness, sexual assault survivors, and much more. Isaac Ryan, the director of UCLA's Black Policy Center, points to history. Law enforcement in the South began a slave patrol, a team of vigilance hired 
to recapture escaped slaves. Then when slavery was abolished, police enforced Jim Crow laws, even the most minor fractions. And today, police disproportionately use force against black people and black people are more likely to be arrested, arrested and sentenced. That history is ingrained in our law enforcement, Brian says. Divesting funds ends the culture of punishment in the criminal justice system, says Philip McHarris, a, doctor, a doctoral candidate in sociology at Yale University and lead research and policy associate at the Community Resource Hub for Safety and Accountability. Defunding law enforcement means that we are reducing the ability for law enforcement to have resources that harm our community, says Patrice Culler, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. Those dollars can be put back in social services for mental health, domestic violence, and homelessness, among others. Police are often the first responders to all three. She said, those dollars can be used to fund schools, hospitals, housing, and, it, and food in those communities too. All of the things we now increase safety, McCarris says. That's the end of that letter, and that was bar by Jocelyn. Um, we're going to take a brief recess. It's actually 6.31. We'll take a brief recess. We're back from recess. Um, we're going to continue by reading the uh, next two. Uh, we had two more emails, and then we will start with our budget hearings. John Rodriguez, Winthrop Street, to whom it may concern, through my live experience as a lifelong Brockton resident, I was often critical of the correlation between the presence of violence and adequate resource options offered to members of the city. Rather than investing in resources and social services and programs that would de decrease violence, elected officials within the city have decided to overfund and militarize our police department with no evidence that this in fact contributes to a decrease in violence. Given the current state of affairs in this country and the tension that exists between mi minoritized communities and police departments, this is due to the overfunding and over surveillance of the police department. As a Brockton resident, the time allotted for public comment only being 30 minutes is not only unacceptable, it is unjust and utter disregard to the voice of citizens of the city. We demand to be heard, defund the Brockton police, and properly reallocate this funding into public education, housing, food security, and artistic outlet and spaces for youth. We are watching and we will be holding our elected officials accountable. John Rodriguez, um, Woodruff Street. We do have, uh, the last email is from SEIU, Local 509. Um, technically, it should be Brockton residents, but I know a lot of Brockton residents belong to this union, so I will read it. Good afternoon, all. Please see the attached letter regarding SEIU Local 509's position on divest and invest regarding police budgets. Um, as a union of human service workers, health workers, and educators, racial justice is a core value of our union. Local 509 members call on you to partner with us in doing the work of creating an anti-racist society beginning with Brockton, where hundreds of us live and serve the community every day. Our union's racial justice task force has identified issues of policing as a key area where we have an opportunity to lay the foundation of this work for residents of Brockton. With Brockton's next budget vote coming up, we urge you to take brave and bold action to divest funds from the police department and reallocate those funds to long-term community programs, such as education, restorative justice services, mental health and substance abuse services, and employment services. Unlike other city and town departments, police are often given a blank check when they're allotted line item runs over. This must stop. It is time to prioritize the health and safety of our community over police budgets and institutions that criminalize and harm black and brown people. Reducing police budgets can happen through withdrawing police departments from state and federal grant programs that provide surveillance tech, military gear, weapons, training, and automated decision making tools. Denying benefits slash pay to police officers under investigation for using excessive force, requiring police officers, not cities, to pay for misconduct 
lawsuits and use of forced settlements, removing police from schools and universities, establishing non-police alternatives to 911 calls involving people with mental health needs or other forms of health crisis, reappealing laws that hide slash enable slash excuse police violence and misconduct, reallocating resources towards the well-being of our black and brown residents and is not only the best way to begin addressing systematic racism, it, is, it also offers a check on the too powerful. That's from SEIU Local 509. So I'll... Um, all these um, have gone into the record and as well as the letters that have been given to us. Before we uh, conclude, I will just check on my phone, the um, live feed. I think there's one comment and then we can move on with the budget hearings. <clears throat> I'm not, I, I was told there was a comment on here, but I think we already read them or they have not stated their address. It says Gregory 54 School Street, but um, this meeting is illegal. That was the comment that's on YouTube Live. So when I'm on my phone, I'm checking the YouTube Live stream. Um, that concludes the public comment part. And once again, due to COVID-19, that is the reason that these hearings were, um, City Hall is close to the public, and that's why um, the public couldn't be in here to make these comments themselves. So we have taken these emails and read them and read the comments on YouTube. So I hereby close the uh, public comment part of these budget hearings. Madam Chair. Councilor Fowler. May I have 60 seconds just to insert some information relative to the budget and it really is germane to most of those letters and emails that you just read. Sure, but how about I, we, op we open the, we'll open the uh, budget hearings now because I think we just closed the public comment part. I hereby um, open the budget hearings for FY21 for Wednesday, June 24th. It is 6.43 p.m. Yes, Council Fowler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just for our colleagues and for the public, there is already a 2% reduction in the police personal services non-overtime budget. That is $588,464. There has been a 19% reduction in purchase of services, and that looks to be about a $170,000 reduction. Uh, there is a 20% reduction in capital outlay, which probably means uh, we will be driving uh, older police vehicles and repairing them. And there is a 5% reduction in overtime. Uh, I think it's important to have that on the record. Uh, the monies that are saved out of the police budget allowed the mayor to put together a spending plan, which includes a 2.8% increase in the school budget. And I think that's very germane to all of the letters and emails we just uh, read. And I thank you for the time. Thank you, Councillor. So um, as we did last night, we will have one department head at a time come up before us and um, answer questions. If they have a statement to make, they will make their statements and then answer the questions that councillors have. We do have... Um, a member of our building department that is our custodian that is making sure that uh, after each department head that the podium is sanitized. We are also following all um, rules and regulations by the, that are set for, before us for COVID-19 by the state and the Board of Health. Um, we, are, we have masks on, we have um, plexiglass between the councils we can't, because we can't be six feet apart. So that allows us to have our meeting here this evening. Um, so before we begin, I just, once again, if we could just be whoever's in the gallery, I would prefer that everyone stayed outside, but when they do come into the gallery, you need to be at least six feet apart so um, to, to stay within the state guidelines. With that being said, Madam Clerk, item number one. City Clerk, Anthony J. Zioli, Clerk.
Good evening, Mr. Clark. Good evening, Councilors. Generally, this is my 29th year coming before the body of this council to discuss the budget of the city clerk and the city council. And just as other department heads have come before you and stated that their budgets are either level funded or there are some changes. And after that comment, making a statement that they will take any questions if, uh, if the council has them or so desires. I intend to do that this evening, but however, before I do that, I would find it not responsible on my part if I didn't answer a couple of comments that were made in this council chamber last night, one by Councilor Rodriguez, Councilor Large Rodriguez, and by Councilor Thompson. And that was in reference to the city clerk's department, indicating that that department is closed or has been closed and we have to open City Hall in order for those things to be, be taken care of. City Clerk's office has been physically manned for four out of five days every day since this crisis started. On that fifth day, we are collecting information by emails and letters so that we can respond to them in bulk and get an answer in within 72 hours. Councilor Rodriguez told me uh, or made a statement to the fact that uh, somebody waited 12 days for a birth certificate. I would think that this building would have had a burn down for anybody to wait 12 days for a birth certificate. So I believe that there has to be a lack of communication between the counselor and the individual or somehow the information got fouled up. Councilor Thompson said he saw someone walking around the parking lot not having the ability to, to get inside the building. We have a security guard downstairs. People that call or put on notice that all they have to do is go into that area, tell the security guard that they want to do business with the clerk's office and we take care of them. We are not only doing that with the security guard, but we also have the mayor's office that has put two additional people on answering phones for us to make certain that we don't miss these calls. Okay. So I, I don't know where this is taking place or what, but I certainly want to make it known that that clerk's office has been open and my staff has been working at home remotely before and after the working hours of City Hall's regular time of 8.30 to 4.30, as well as Saturdays and Sundays, and with no overtime requests whatsoever. Okay. Uh, I just I just have to say that I, I hate to have to do this in public, but I think that the comments were made in public. Consequently, they should be answered in public. But I would just like to, to give you some information to back that up so that you don't think that I'm pulling this conversation out of the clouds. The city clerk's office since this epidemic has started. Now bear in mind we're dealing with $24, $12, $8, $14, $112, $862 in fees. When you break that down, we are answering 12,224 calls every three months. Every month we're answering 4,075 calls. Every week, 1,019 calls and 255 a day, not counting other things that we do and that we also do for this council, okay? How anybody could assume that this office has been closed, I'll never know. I will never realize how they put it together. No. This is, these certified copies have brought in $29,337. Okay, so you take on a monthly basis since this epidemic has started, we have brought in $37,621 a month, $9,405 a week, $235, $2,351 a day, 
And actually, when you break it down, we're bringing in $336 an hour. That's, and you know how many people are doing that? Five. Five. Okay? So I just feel that I, I had to bring this out to the council. And if the councilors have questions, they know the phone number of the clerk's office. They know where I'm located. They know that I have a cell phone. Uh, I'd be uh, I, I'd be mistaken if I, I believe none of them knew my cell phone number. I get calls all kinds of days, nights, and weekends, and I'm not opposed to that. But uh, to say that people aren't getting service, and in fact, when you take all of these numbers, dollars and cents, and numbers of things that we're doing, we're actually doing more now during the pandemic than we were when City Hall was fully blown open. So if there are complaints, and I'm sure there are some places, I'm sure we've made some mistakes, but not 12 dollars or 12 hours or 12 minutes or 12 days or 12 weeks to get a certificate. That's unfounded. Unfounded. You know, people don't tell the true story. It almost sounds to me that on that occasion to Council Rodriguez, that there was probably an affidavit of correction that was taking place. That has nothing to do with City Hall or clerk's office. The clerk's office takes these corrections and immediately sends them into Boston for their consideration. Boston never acts on them until 12 days have passed. Maybe that's what happened in your case, but not the fault of the city clerk's office. The affidavit of correction rests with the individual that made the report. They either didn't put the right information down or they refused to put the information down and figured it would go away. And now one month, one day, one year, 20 years later, they found that they need that certificate straightened out and they haven't done it in panic sets in. And now we start to point figures at everybody other than ourselves. So enough said about that. I hope I've made it very clear. The clerk's office is open, it is operating, it is serving your constituents, and you all have the phone numbers. You can call me any time of day. You can email me. Just give me enough time to answer you. You'll get your answer. With that, counselors, on the budget of the city clerk, is level funded, hasn't changed for three years. I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Before we go with the questions, I was going to do this at the beginning and got a little sidetracked, just to make sure that we don't have the same technical issues that we had last night. I'm just going to do a roll call. If you can just say yes into your microphones, just so we can make sure at home that your microphones are working. Uh, let's, I'll go in order. Councilor Ianieri. Yes. Councilor Nicastro. Yes. Councilor Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Cardoso. Yes. Councilor Cruz. Yes. Councilor Monahan. Yes. Councilor Farwell. Yes. Councilor Lally. Yes. Councilor Thompson. Yes. Councilor um, Mendez. Yes. It looks like all the microphones are working this evening. So um, thank you. Any uh, questions for the clerk? Ms. Uh, Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, Mr. Clerk, um, I have a great deal of respect for you, and I've always had. But one of the things that I don't like is words being added to what I said. I never said that there were 12 days that somebody had been waiting. So if you heard of that, I think you need to kind of the words we get that. Heard, I'm just I'm just were that it took 12 days to get a birth certificate. You had your piece. On you had your piece. Let me say mine as well okay, too. Go ahead. Okay. On the 22nd at 1:24, I called your cell phone because I had a constituent. Now, mind you, I'm not, whatever comments I made last night was based on a repre representation from people that, I deal, that we deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. So I had a constituent that actually called and said that they needed a marriage certificate from the clerk's office. And she was told that she needs to write a letter and put in a self-address stamp envelope from, this, this came from the mayor's office that she needs to put in a self-addressed stamp envelope, mail to the city, 
that the city will in turn send her a certificate with, when, with the funds as well too into the city. I called you on the 22nd at 1.24. I called the clerk's office on the same day at 2.07 to try that? to speak. What day was that? The 22nd. No, the day. Two days ago. Tuesday? Monday. 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 Yes. What did I just tell you? you that with the exception of Monday, that the, the personnel in that office, the, on Monday, we are all doing remote work outside of... No, but I called, you, I called your cell phone oh, to try cell. to get some information I did. so that I could basically inform this woman who's, who's pending le you know, legal action from a divorce that, she in, that she's involved in and needs a, 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 a marriage certificate. So I called you. I called the clerk's office. There was no answer. So what do I do? I go back to the, to the citizen, the taxpayer in the community, and say... Wait until I go to City Hall on Tuesday, and I'll find out what goes, what's going on. Yep. I came to this building, and they basically they told me downstairs the clerk's office is closed. That's what I was told. Did you go upstairs, and, Councilor? Huh? Did you go upstairs to the clerk's office? No. When I came into the mayor's office and I asked, they said that the, the clerk's office was closed, and that the clerk's office functions in a different line of responsibilities because it's it's. It goes by a different rules because of the of the, the the type of work that's done by the clerk, Who? meaning that the mayor and the administration runs the city, and then the clerk basically does its part because of the clerk work and the fact that you work for the legislative body of the count uh, of the city council that you follow a different rules. Oh, councilor, that I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you what was said to me, and I don't have any reason to and do you that. The councilor accepted that. No, I didn't. That's why I brought up and I asked the, 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 the person who's responsible for the building, when is this building going to be open for the public? And why didn't you ask that of the mayor? No, I asked it when it came why to me. Why didn't you ask that of the mayor? I have no control as to when this building is going to be opened or closed. I can only handle my office. The mayor is in charge of opening and closing this building. Why didn't you go directly to the mayor? No, I asked the, administ the administrator who was here yesterday from the building department, and that's basically what was said. So I'm just saying that I'm just saying that somehow, you know, this whole nonsense of, of you know, he said this, he said that. All I'm doing is my job in terms of passing that information on from the people that elected us to be here, and that's all I was doing. Councillor, I've been around a long time. This is not my first. I was Rodeo. just here two days ago. Councillor, councillor, and, and uh, I don't Mr. Clark. That. At all, Councillor uh, Councillor Rodriguez, I'm sure you can, if you want to continue this conversation, it can be done after the hearing. Madam President, but right now we need to get back Madam to the President, budget. Madam so President, I'm going to go back and say I said this before, and I'm going to say it again. I was not put in this council appointedly. When somebody comes and points the finger, Correct. any of us, we have an obligation to defend yes, our honor. Yes, well. you do, Councillor. But these are budget hearings, so if we want to um, so get through them, then we should have stuck with the budget from the very get-go. I'm sorry? We should have stuck with the budget from the very get-go and not have statements made. When statements are made, people have to answer I'm not disagreeing with you, Mr. That. Clerk. I we're going to take questions on the budget. I agree with that, Councillor. Um, you should have abided by that. Councillor, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, let's, uh, Councillor Thompson, you have a question regarding the budget? <laughs> uh, regarding the budget specifically, <laughs> yeah. no, but I, I'll make it very quick, uh, and I apologize. Um, so, Mrs. Uh, Zioli, um, my position was not to make any disparagement remarks against your office. I know their work and I know they're doing their job, but the job is always done more efficiently when there's a face-to-face -face interaction. My, my comment was that some of these matters are time sensitive when uh, the, the, the format that a uh, Councilman uh, Rodriguez set forth of sending in a self-addressed <clears throat> stamped envelope and waiting for a response, um, that, that takes more time than what, it, what would it take if they can just come to the, um, the, the window and do their job. Uh, do their Councilors, we're That's not gonna open up a discussion. Ms. You have Ms. the clerk's number. You can discuss this outside of the hearings. We, yeah, after yesterday's hearings, I got calls from numerous uh, councilors saying, please, let's stay on the budget. So I'm going to stick to it. All if right. you have questions to the clerk's budget, you can speak later, please Mrs. Yoli. let Thank me you. know. Councilor Mendez, do you have a question regarding the clerk's budget? I do have a question please regarding the- go ahead and ask the clerk your question. Hi, um, yes, yeah, so my question is regarding the microfilming. What, what is the microfilming and do we even- um, Microfilming is the microfilming and microfishing that we're doing 
on all of the records as they come in so that we can create an archive to have these things not only on paper but on microfilm or microfiche and put them in another location in the event that we have a fire in this building. Okay, because uh, I was just wondering if we still use that because we had the same amount budgeted last year and then it was a zero that we spent it, so maybe that was something that was discontinued because I looked it up online to see what it was and it seemed very old, so I was like, no, maybe no, we're still, we still we're use still, it? We're still doing that and we still have the equipment and hardware and how to read the old type of uh, microfilm. So okay. And that is at another location. Mr. Clark. Oh, thank and you. We still have stuff that... Uh, stuff, information that's on disks as well. And we have the software that goes with those programs put away as well. Thank you. That, that's yeah, thank you. All set, Councillor? Yes, all set, thank you. Councillor Castro. Thank you, good evening, Mr. Clark. Thank you for being here. That's and fine. thank you for all the help you give me, your office gives me, and word four by extension. I have a question regarding full-time salaries that are listed in the budget book. I noticed that your proposed salaries are an increase of about $41,000, um, but you mentioned earlier in your remarks that it was level funded. And so I'm wondering. Of an increase of 41000 Yes. Under full-time salaries on page 96. Was, yeah, was that a position that was just put on by the uh, union contract? Is that a uh, I don't know. Work too? Uh, I don't know. You list on page 95, you list four employees, including yourself, and two, two that are vacant but funded. You have, you have six down there, right? Right. Let me just pull that up here if we would. Four, five, six. So perhaps that's the addition of um, Bidey Ferris, who returned to the office. City clerk, now we have full-time salaries, right? Right. Okay, so you're just taking the increase from 345000 to 386000 Yes, that's right. That would be because of union contracts and increases in pay across the board. Oh, oh really? Okay. Because the, the amount of increase, $40,850, lines up with... Um, what you're paying an administrative assistant to. Because you have uh, here, you have the administrative assistant, right. right? And then you have the assistant two at 49,000. Okay. And then you have another assistant two at 40,000. Okay. And then you have the assistant clerk and a junior clerk that are not filled. Right. Okay, yeah. So that's why there's an increase. But if you, do you, take, do you, if you take that total amount and look at last year's overall increase in the clerk's office, it should just about be equal. Okay. And so um, do you intend to hire an assistant city clerk this year? I would like to do that. I've been without one for 12 years. Right. And I need one. I've been without a secretary for 12 years. I've been short staffed like other departments for over 10 years. Yeah, I would like to see the changes, but I don't know if we're gonna be able to do that with the type of a financial crisis we're in. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we've been handling the department these past years without those uh, adjustments. And if we have to continue to do so, we have to. But that, that money uh, is requested, and if we could use it, we'd like to. If not, it goes back to the general fund. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, Councillor. Any other questions for the clerk, Councillors? With no other questions, uh, Madam Clerk, item number two on the agenda, please. City Council, Anthony Jazioli, clerk. Do you have a statement, Mr. Clerk, or just um, you take taking Again, questions? I say that that uh, council budget is the same as it has been, with the exception of increases through contracts and negotiations that have taken place. Councilor Cardoso. I'm sorry, can I just go back to the clerks? Um, Tony, the assistant city clerk and the junior clerk, um, 
What are those two positions similar? I know there's a big difference in the salary, but is it all? Can you explain those the need for those two positions? Again, Councilor, your question is the assistant clerk? Yeah, the assistant city clerk and then the junior clerk. So the assistant city clerk, does the junior clerk work under no, that assistant? No, it just, that just happens the way it's outlined mm -hmm. on it. It isn't as though that junior clerk is working for the assistant clerk. Okay, the, so uh, the chain of commands would be clerk, assistant clerk, administrative assistant, senior clerk or uh, administration clerk one, two, and three, and then junior clerk. That just happens to be the way it was posted. Okay. And you're looking to hire that one as well? Again. I'm sorry, so you're looking to hire that uh, junior? Yeah, again, if, you know, if the budget permits it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, any other questions for the um City Council budget item. Nope. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Okay, well, thank you very much, Councilors. I'm sorry that I took up so much of your time. We'll went off the budget procedure. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, thank you. Matteo, can you just make sure to disinfect? Madam Clerk, number three. Library, Paul Engel, Director. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Angle. How are you? Good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm good. How are you? Good. Do you have a statement or do you just... Uh, just briefly that um, I'm presenting to you a, um, a library budget that is, uh, looks like about five or six percent under what we had in FY20. Um, and the most, um, the biggest hit that I see is the, is the shift differential line uh, that was cut in half. and. Um, the impact that will have would be. I'm sorry. Do you want? I didn't understand everything. Do you want to move your mask just so? Can <laughs> sure. I, is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I if just you want to repeat that, please. Yeah. This this is a, a budget that is coming in at about five or six percent under the FY20 budget, and the most notable cut that I that we agreed to was the shift differential cut, which will impact some of our um, our programming moving forward into the next year. Other than that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about the budget. Councilor Cruz. Good evening. Um, the cut of dropping about 5%, is that going to affect your state accreditation at all? We're, we're hoping not. I, I haven't gotten all the specifics about uh, what they're going to change or if they're going to change uh, uh, the requirements for, for uh, state aid. Um, the one that I'm most concerned with and the one that most library directors are concerned with in Massachusetts is the fact that we've been closed. And, and, so, and, I, and I know that the, uh, the commissioners are looking closely at that and, and they're not trying to harm any of us. Uh, they understand that the, the, this virus has caused public library systems to shut down. So, uh, but we're, we're in good state, we're good stead with the, um, the, the, the municipal appropriations. We, we actually added a little bit of money there. And, um, and, and so I think we're gonna be okay, Councilor, but, but we're all watching very closely how the, how the the commissioners respond to the, the closing. Thank you. Probably. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Fowler. Mr. Engel, I, uh, I don't have any questions uh, for you uh, of a technical nature. I, I want to say that since you've some, come here, I think you've done an exemplary job. I know it's tough presiding over a library system which has been closed, and I know a lot of residents have called and said, when are the libraries going to open? When are the libraries going to open? something I want my colleagues to take cognizance of, and that is uh, when you were hired, you, you did not come in at top step. As a matter of fact, your salary is $100,413. I want everyone to take a look at page 319 and all of the responsibilities that this man has in terms of supervising different functions and different personnel in the library system for $100,413. You'll understand at another time, probably Thursday night, 
while, why I am raising this, and I, I will tell you that I think for the amount of money we're paying Mr. Engel, we have a gem here. I think he's completely devoted to the library system. I think he's completely immersed in what a library system is supposed to be, and I'm proud to have you part of the city of Brockton. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Any uh, Councilor Cruz? I one with whatever you Any, did I, do any councils that haven't asked any questions want, want Councilor Nicastro. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Engel. Good, Good to evening, see you. Councilor. Good to see you. I just want to say how I believe you've enhanced our city with the, all of the programs you've been doing. The, the programs about women's rights and segregation have just, suffrage mm -hmm. have just been so interesting. It, I regret that we haven't been able to do them live. I've seen a little bit of them virtually and I wish I could see more, it always conflicts with some meeting. But I just think that um, you've tapped into something important, bringing important information into the community. And I'm excited to have us resume normal one day and, and go back to seeing these things live, but doing them virtually is still getting the information out. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and one thing librarians like to do is to, is to is to provide safe spaces and safe access to, to right. ideas and to the, the dis discussion of ideas. Mm -hmm. And so when we had to do this in the virtual world, we just, we just it, it didn't really change our, our thinking, it just changed how we did it. And mm -hmm. I owe that to the staff we have, I owe that to some of the volunteers we have, mm -hmm. and, we, you know, and just pe creative people doing creative things. Yes, it's a great place. I look forward to returning to that beautiful building. Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. we all miss you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other counselors? No, nope. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Actually, I'd be remiss and my family would kill me if I didn't mention the one major difference from last year's uh, budget. <laughs> Many people don't know yet because we haven't been able to have the official mm -hmm. uh, unveiling, but the library has been renamed the Thomas P. Kennedy Main Branch Library in Brockton. And it, it, it was quite a thing. Uh, many of you who were around 20 years ago when the library needed a re refurbishing and the first meeting that w was happening, Senator Kennedy got invited to the meeting and we had to have it out in the parking lot because it was not handicapped accessible. And between the Library Foundation, and Stanton Davis family, and the state, we were able to put the money together to rebuild and that is one of the most beautiful buildings in Brockton. Yes. And I'm very proud that it's now the Thomas Kennedy Library. And when this all ends, we'll have a nice event to, uh, to uh, unveil the sign, but I'm sure many of you have driven by it and it is a, an important thing to me and my family, but I think to everybody in Brockton that that building is so usable now for everybody. So thank you for what you've done on that aspect and especially thank you to Representative Cassidy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D Director. And I, I agree with that. I love the libraries are my favorite place and our main library is absolutely beautiful. So thank you for all that you do. I think that that's it. Um, no further questions for you. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Four, retirement contributory. Jean Martineau, director. Yes, you can place your stuff. Good evening, Madam Director. You can take the mask off just so we can understand you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, counselors. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jean Martineau. I'm the Executive Director for Brockton Retirement. Established on July 1, 1936, the Brockton Contributory Retirement System consists of approximately 1,500 retirees and 2,000, over 2,000 active and inactive members. The City, Brockton Housing Authority, Brockton Area Transit, and the Brockton Redevelopment Authority are all contributing units to this system. Mass General Law Chapter 32 mandates that your Board of Trustees shall consist of five members. Two are elected by the membership, that is Archie Gormley and Scott Albanese. Two are appointed by the Mayor, that is your former CFO, Jay Condon, and our ex-officio, Marilyn Peters Chu. And then the fifth member is independently voted by the four members. That member shall be independent of the system. And that is William Farmer, 
and he is actually the former director of the Plymouth County Retirement System, so he comes to us with such a wealth of information. It's the board's duty to provide secure retirement benefits to the pensioners and beneficiaries through efficient and careful oversight of the investment <coughs> practices. Daily operations of the office are administered by the executive director and the staff. The trustees meet monthly so that they may vote on matters of policy and continue to be updated on topics that come before the board. We are committed to earning and maintaining the trust of our participants through quality customer service and protecting future benefits in compliance with Mass General Law Chapter 32, 840, CMR, and case law. The request that comes before you is an assessment which was developed by the fund's actuary and approved by the Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission, which is PERAC, and that's the state's regulatory authority that oversees us. So this assessment for FY 2021 is $28,451,613. You'll take questions, but you're all set. Councilors, any questions? Jean? No questions? Uh, oh, Councilor Cruz? And this may be for Troy. Um, I, I get confused every year, but this is something we've been, had the state had had us on a payment plan to fully fund this over the next 15 or 20 years. Isn't that true? I'll answer that. The, the actuarial study that we have currently in place, this schedule here, has us fully funded at 2032. Now, we are currently undergoing another study. Um, we hope to be meeting with the actuary in July. I will be sending you an email um, because we like to invite the CFO so that they have input on the schedule. Um, so we will see where it comes out when we do the new funding schedule because they'll be taking, they'll be looking at assets as of 12-31-2019, uh, assets and liabilities. We're very fortunate that this is our val year and we're not going to be valing in 12-31 of 2020. Because I assume it's been a pretty tough year for, for the fund also. Well, the, the market did very well last year. Last year. We had 58 million in, in excess investment returns. You know, looking at the market right now, we don't anticipate having those kind of returns. We have to be realistic. Right. We can hope. Mm -hmm. So 2032 and we're still on pace for now that right now. We are on schedule for 2032. I mean, that may well change. By law, we have until 2040, and that's what the board made the responsible choice to go to 2032 so that they had some wiggle room in the event that they needed to change the funding schedule, you know, they could perhaps extend it out. We're hoping that we don't have to. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Councilor. Any other Councilors have any questions? Nope. Thank you, Madam Director, and have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Madam Clerk, number five. Southeast Regional School, Luis Lopes, Superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent Lopes. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I just, um, as I we, we present our budget, our certified budget amount, I just want to just kind of um, um, state that that this was based on the original certified required minimum contributions. Um, since then, the school committee has um, proactively cut about 1.7 million out of our budget. However, we cannot recertify the budget until we get those revised numbers from the state. So. Uh, so, so, uh, so the budget uh, we're presenting tonight reflects a $97,000 decrease from the previous year, and we anticipate that actually going down a little bit more. But, but so as soon as we get those numbers, we will, we'll have a, a special school committee meeting, have them recertify those numbers, and then adjust those figures. But at a minimum, the budget request of uh, $3,954,521 reflects a $97,000 $97, decrease uh, from the previous year. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Ms. Lopes. Um, just a bit of interest in 
remote learning was terrible for all of the kids, but your kids in particular, how do you learn how to sweat a plumbing joint or uh, uh, become a carpenter? What did, you, what did you do as far as all of that goes, or could you not? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's been a challenge, you know, to be, be honest. We, we had a little bit of an advantage, but we had, we had uh, switched to one-to-one, uh, -to -one, all kids have Chromebooks. We did that about four years ago, um, so, and the staff uh, was all trained on that. Um, so they were prepared for that. We had been experimented with it a little bit on in Lewis No Days a few years ago and last year. Um, so, um, so our attendance still hovered around 89, 90 percent, even though remote, even through remote learning. Um, but as you correctly stated, there are certain hands-on physical components that the students were not able to do. Did did the best we could. Some students were able to continue on through their through their cooperative education, working with employers and companies that remained open. Um, but for the majority of them. And so what we've done is we've identified, um, in addition to the final grades, every teacher has identified those gaps in learning, and now we're formulating a plan on how to address those. Individually? Um, individually, oh. in the, over the, whether over the summer or in the fall. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor, Councilor, Councilor Nicastro. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Lopes. Thanks for being here. Uh, my question is, what is the total enrollment at Southeastern Regional at this time? So our enrollment is uh, 1,512, I believe. Um, I'll get you the exact number. Um, um, from Brockton, there's 945 students, representing about 62% of our population. Our enrollment has, has, um, um, has steadily increased. It actually shows a little bit of a decrease this year, but uh, we have a record number of students coming in. We had over 1,000 applicants this past year. Uh, for, so we increased our capacity to 400 students as opposed to 375 to try to, you know, try to, try to get some more students that show the desire to attend. Sure. Um, so it's by application? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, the state um, approves your, your admissions. It's, it's what's called a blind admissions. You're only, we're able to look at four criteria. Mm -hmm. They get ranked and we just start with the top number and go down, draw a line, accept those 400 and some choose not to, not to attend and then we just keep going down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, until we're full in September, and then as you know, if there are any drops, we just refill them. Have you have you an idea of how many students continue on with education upon graduation? So we're about um, we're we're about uh, almost 50-50 right now. Um, you know, we might actually be be closer to 55 percent uh, attending you know two or four year universities or technical mm -hmm. schools. As many of you know, um, you know the job requirements change. Um, from the 60s and 70s, a lot of these these jobs require additional, um, you, you know, at a minimum, a, a two-year uh, technical certificate or associate's degree, or or some of the you know, like the IT-related and engineering positions require a, the minimum of a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor, Councilor, Councilor Good evening. You you and your staff do an exemplary job. Uh, and now that I've buttered you up, I was going to ask Superintendent Thomas this. Any super secret information that you really shouldn't tell us about when you think school will open? <laughs> have, have there been discussions or? As we were just talking about that outside. Uh, you know, we were hoping, we were waiting there. My understanding is there may be a, uh, there may be a, a little bit of an announcement tomorrow from the oh, governor's really? office um, uh, and the commissioner. So, but, uh, but we're waiting, we're, 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 we're kind of game planning and, and just like just all of you, we're, we're kind of con doing some contingency planning if we open up 50 percent, 25 percent, zero or 100. So the key is to be flexible and that, that's whatever we're doing, we're trying to be able to, even if we open up, you know, almost full, full capacity and then we need, there's an outbreak or something or, you know, we have to scale back. <coughs> so we're just trying to, trying to maintain as much flexibility, but, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Lopes, how are you? Well, as, um, as you know, your student population, especially for those students from Brockton, are quite diverse. Uh, but, I, but I know that your staff is not. What efforts or initiatives have you put into that school to diversify your, your staff population in a sense to, I'm not saying that it needs to resemble the, the student population, but it becomes a little more resembling of the student population mm -hmm. of the school. It, we, and, and our HR director has done a great job trying to get it better, um, but you're absolutely right. It's still, 
And, and what we do is when we, we identify those that are underrepresented, you know, teaching uh, guidance was, guidance is not now, but um, some of our powers, powers is, are doing a lot better. Um, and so we, we extend uh, deadlines. We actually reach out to all the local agencies. We work um, um, with, with some, so anytime there's a posting, we, we reach out to, to, to the diversity, local diversity committees and so forth, trying to, trying to attract um, um, a diverse um, staff. Um, so, so it is an area that we're, we're trying to improve on um, and it, it has, it has um, been better over the last four to five years, but it's, we still have a way to go. Because especially when it comes to dealing with your, your paras or your so-called paraprofessionals in the schools, because um, I know for a fact that there's quite a few parents that have a real tough time in uh, speaking, especially those bilinguals or trilingual folks that we're dealing with on a regular basis that have a real tough time reaching the staff at the schools to communicate with them about the issues that they're facing with their, with their ch children, basically, because there's a lack of... Uh, language services coming from your side of things. There is, and, and uh, at our, so two sides to that. Our English language learning population is actually, as a percentage-wise, been the biggest increase uh, over the past two years, percentage-wise. Um, um, and um, um, we actually had uh, a two very qualified and, and, uh, and great uh, additions that, that uh, we just found out. I just found out today that one of them, uh, a Cape Verde uh, gentleman who uh, who is taking a job at the local charter school, uh, get making more money? So I can't fault him for that. But um, but he's going to be he's going to be missed because he was part of our um, he was part of a lot of our committees, uh, worked directly with students, directly with the ELL students, uh, and also um, with providing um, outreach to parents and so forth. So we need to find that replacement. Will you make that effort we, to we will. Uh, make that sure is, that is? I will tell you that that is the one area out of the 1.7 million dollars that we did not cut. In fact, we're still expanding that program okay. the, our, our Yelp, and because, of, because of the need. And that's an identified need um, that we have. All right, thank Definitely you. Definitely one thank of you. our priorities. Thank you. Council Cruz. Thank you. I just one other statement I'd like to make to advertise for your school. I sell plumbing supplies. The average age of a plumber in the state is 59 years old. The average age of an electrician is 58 years old. All of the trades are dying for people to get to work there. And particularly second language uh, plumbers and, and electricians and, and tradesmen. If you parents are watching and you have an eighth grader, get them in the trades. They're gonna graduate when they're 18 or 17 from high school and they're gonna be offered full-time jobs that are well-paying long before everybody else who's going to four-year schools and paying a fortune to go get that degree and then having trouble getting a job when they get out. I can tell you that the trades are dying for young people right now. So go over there, get your degree, and learn how to learn how to plumb, learn how to HVAC, electrician. You're never going to be out of work, and you're going to be happy, and, and uh, you'll be working full time from the day you graduate high school. Thank you. And you're absolutely right in terms of the being bilingual. I was born in Lisbon, and, and the fact that I speak fluent Portuguese, and you know, and having that skill. Um, and people need to recognize that it's it's it's, it's not necessarily it's not a barrier. It's it's, it's no, it's just the opposite. I, uh, there uh, are business people I deal with that would kill for more second language um, uh, employees because they don't have people they can send into a lot of you know. Obviously, we all know our country has changed, and they they don't have the staff to send in to places where they can, you know there becomes a language barrier uh, for their work, and it's uh, the. They'll, they'll all get jobs, I can guarantee it. I agree. All set, Councillor. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I've allowed some leeway to kind of go off budget, but if we can try to keep the questions to the budget, that would be, um, that would be great. Uh, Councillor Lally. Uh, my question was, was more off of uh, what Councillor Cruz had said and not as close to the budget, uh, but it is. This is your meeting. I mean, I'm just going by what you yeah. all want so the, um, I'll be I'll be really quick trades are really important uh, I said it last year I'll say it this year I have uh, two friends of mine who are twins uh, they went to Bristol Plymouth they live you know closer to Fall River one is going to be a lawyer one is now an electrician the electrician is making more than what his brother is racking up in debt <laughs> it's uh, I as as someone who went you know the the normal route I don't like that it's considered the normal route into college um, it, much more of a waste of your time and money 
than than learning uh, than learning a trade. Thank we're, you. we're lucky in Brockton. Uh, Brockton, uh, we work very well uh, uh, with this, with with the, the school department, and, and in fact, we've extended. I don't know if you've heard about our SOAR program. We provide. Um, we provide vocational training for kids who, who attend Brockton public schools, high schools. Uh, they can come to, uh, come to us after, after school three days a week and learn those technical skills. So you, so you can still do both, no matter where you go. Great. Which is great. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors, on the budget? Well, I would just like to um, just remind everybody that your, our S Southeastern Regional School Committee member, Tony Branch, did make a statement at the beginning during uh, the hearing part that he supports your budget and supports you. So um, thank you. I just want to make sure that that was and put into Justin the record. Montero is, done, is the other uh, elected appointed yes. official. Right? No, the only re reason I stated is because he sent us a message, so I want to make sure that it was read into the record. So um, thank you, Superintendent. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening. Matt, uh, and I'd also like to recognize that we've had our mayor in chambers. Good evening, mayor. Thank you for being here. And uh, Troy, our CFO, Troy Clarkson, has been here for any questions that anybody has that um, if, it, if a department head can't answer them for them. Uh, Madam Clerk, number s six. School Department, Mike Thomas, Superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent Thomas. I know that you have our, your um, Chief Financial Officer, Aldo Petronio, with you. So good evening, Aldo, and some school committee members. I know that uh, Vice Chair of the School Committee, Mark D'Agostino, is here. Cynthia Mendez, Joyce Azak, Tony Rodriguez, and Tim Sullivan are here to support you. This is the, their budget and their elected officials. They're all sitting six feet apart in chambers. And of course, we have um, our mayor, who is the chair of the school committee. So good evening, Superintendent. Good evening, Councilor. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, first, I want to thank the mayor, the school committee, and you, the city council, for your support you. of the Brockton Public Schools uh, always, but especially during this closure. Um, it's been a long haul uh, for our families, for our students. Um, and it was a lot of work for our staff. We were not ready or set up for remote learning. As you know, our budget has been cut year after year by the state, um, and we always cut technology. So not only were laptops cut all the time, but uh, professional development for our staff, uh, more training for students to use it. So we really had to work quickly to switch over to a remote learning plan um, that usually takes a year and a half for a school system to switch over to. We had to do it within pretty much three weeks. Uh, but I want to thank the school committee for allowing me to lend out 6,500 laptops to our families that needed them. I want to thank Title I, who was able to purchase 550 Wi-Fi hotspots, because we did give out the laptops, but connect, uh, the internet connection was an issue for a lot of families, so it was important for us to get the Wi-Fi hotspots out there. Um, and then our, our lunch program, uh, our lunch staff for getting the 10 grab-and-go lunch locations set up so quickly. Uh, we closed on a Thursday, um, and we were set up to serve lunches that following Monday and have been ever since our closure. And those 10 grab-and-go locations will go through the whole summer. So I want to thank everybody for their hard work. So back on January 25th, the governor released his budget, and we finally had something to cheer about in Brockton. The Student Opportunity Act passed. Um, our increase from FY20 was 21 million in the governor's budget. And 18 million of that was an increase from the Student Opportunity Act. We finally got the money back we lost for the low income students that all of a sudden the state in 2015 decided that they were not low income anymore. Uh, we, lost, we lost at that time 4,000 students that were not considered uh, low income. Uh, they put that money back. That gave us $10 million of discretionary spending. So back on March 3rd, the school committee voted to hire 93 teaching positions with that money, with some of that money. 13 of those were adjustment counselors. Six of those were guidance counselors. The rest were classroom teachers to bring down class size. We, we voted to hire six paras to fulfill every uh, para in every kindergarten class. We were going to expand our pre-K programs, put back technology and desperately needed programs for students. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So now, with the hard work of the mayor, Aldo and Troy, and the school, school committee, um, we are at level funding. Um, my, we started level funding minus 
what, what some revenues we were able to save in busing and some other um, things that we didn't have to spend in the spring. Um, we were level funding minus 2%. So our net school spending, our net school budget given to us, um, again, after a lot of hard work, is 165927000 um, So to get to the cuts we had to make um, to get level funded, um, we had to cut 20, we had to do 24 layoff notices to our um, certified staff, our teaching staff. But we also did not fill 40 retirements. So this total is 64 teaching staff that were eliminated. Uh, 15 para paraprofessional layoffs, another 15 paraprofessionals that retired and were open positions that we did not fill, that's 30 paraprofessionals. We have 30 MTA layoffs, which are monitor teacher assistants. Um, 24 of those were open and those are do not fill and we had to send out six, uh, six uh, RIF notices. We have uh, four administrative um, non-fills or layoffs. Uh, we took the substitute teacher budget and pretty much put it to zero to save jobs because we don't know even if we're going to be able to use substitute teachers next year. Um, and we eliminated a lot of programs um, that we don't know if we're going to be able to run next year to get to a level a level funded budget. So, so that's the, the net school side of things. Uh, the non-net budget, um, we needed 13 million 595,000, that's for crossing guards and buses. Uh, we have 11,553,000. McKenney Vento put back 600,000 of that, so we're short on the bus and money by 1,431,000. Uh, so right now, um, we would be at, 50, from 55 buses, which we ran last year, to 37. At this time, that's not as much as a, a concern for me because we don't know if we're going to be able to put students on buses next year, and if we are able to put them on, we're going to probably have to make several runs back and forth to schools because we'll probably be at half capacity or maybe only 30% capacity on buses. Um, so basically, that's pretty much where we are with the budget, as again, we were celebrating in late January, and now uh, we're stumbling through. It's unfortunate that we do not have a Chapter 70 number from the state. Um, and we do not know when, where, when that is coming. Um, we're hoping that they come out with some kind of level funding and also hold on to some of the Student Opportunity Act money. The Student Opportunity Act, as you, as you know, is law. So um, they have to determine whether they're going to fund some of that this year. They have seven years to pretty much fully fund the Student Opportunity Act. So whether they decide to give us back some of that money this year would be obviously very important and really would help us going forward. So obviously I'll answer any questions. What I passed out in the beginning, just so you have it, is, is our reopening plan. Um, currently we have about 70 people throughout the district working um, on my reopening committee. Uh, and we're planning for every different scenario for reopening schools in September. There is word um, that we, we have a call tomorrow with Commissioner Riley for superintendents only at 10 o'clock, and then there's a press conference for, um, with Governor, the Governor Baker's doing that at noontime. We're supposed to get the initial opening guidance, reopening guidance from the state tomorrow, so we'll see what, what that is, and it's obviously, obviously subject to change as, as we move through the summer. But we've been planning for every possible scenario uh, over the last month and a half, and we will be all summer. Thank you, Superintendent Thomas, and I agree with you. January, we were all happy and excited. I don't think anybody foresaw what was uh, going to, where we were going to be today. So um, we're all devastated, disappointed, but um, we're going to get through it. So, counselors, um, questions for Superintendent. Um, Councilor Ian Neary, you had your hand up first. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and, and good evening, Superintendent Thomas. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, before us, at, as usual and always, and just in a different location than you always were before, but uh, um, I welcome that uh, as well, and I'm sure everybody else um, welcomes that for what we've been going through over these past several months. It has not been easy, uh, not easy for you, nor, nor the new mayor to come into, um, as we say, January, we're all smiling and all riding high to to what the year was going to bring us and all the new things that could happen. Um, and all of a sudden it just, um, winter doesn't have it as slowing down, but all of a sudden it sped up and it went in the wrong direction. 
I would have preferred three nor'easters than to have what we what we had. To be truthful with you, don't tell Larry Raleigh that. But I mean, that's the way I that's the way I looked at it, anyways. Um, but I, I I do um I, I I do want to just commend. Um, I'm I'm not going to be one that's going to ask types of questions because I don't think there's too many questions to be asked. To be truthful with you, I don't think any of us really can ask you what about this, this, and this in October, November, September because those aren't answers. And how far we're going to be able to get and what kind of money comes back. Um, other than when money does come back, I, I know I feel very strong to the fact that between our mayor and between yourself and between Mr. Clarkson and our esteemed school committee members, that we're gonna make sure that education um, is one on the top burner as well as police, as I said, police and fire, because I think that's what's most important. But um, I, do wanna, I do wanna commend you. I wanna commend um, the mayor. I wanna commend the members of the, um, the school committee um, I actually, um, there's not been many times when I sit down and watch television and watch it all the time because you're doing something, but what could you do during these past few months but follow the rules and regulations that the mayor put on me and I, I didn't want to be out after nine o'clock because I'm, you know, I'm beyond that. But um, when I heard um, and even watched you on your, um, um, you know, on the Zoom uh, um, meetings and you were starting to talk about the financial impact that, that this was all going to have on on everything in the school department it uh, it brought back to me a lot of older times when you know we were hit with proposition two and a half and um you know just trying to make decisions and watching some of the uh, committee members um you know uh, just just watching in their expression their face that i can't believe we're doing this and even uh, the vice chairman who who does an outstanding job mark and, and running the uh, meetings and indicating yeah we don't want to do this but we had no choice. I mean, it was really, it was really, uh, if people were watching, it was, um, it wasn't something that none of us want to do, nor do we want to do it here. If we, even if we have to do it in this building, we've had to do it in some spots, but I, I do, I do mean that, uh, it was very, um, very heart wrenching to see that. And, uh, I hope people realize, uh, um, that what's being done is, is not done because we have to, it, it's because we've been pushed into it. Um, I hope that we're able to see some of our funding come back and be able to be put back in place because we worked so hard these last few years to bring back what was taken away from us after all those years that we finally got back. So I'm not going to go on and, and, and speak in, in regards to that, nor am I going to ask you questions, and I hope that we can keep it if there are. We just keep it to whatever this budget says, but I think it says it all, and why take and try to tear it apart because it's not it's not worth that but I, j I just want to um, commend you um, as you know I had 20 years in the school committee so I know the uh, I know the feeling of what you went through um, and it's not and it's not done done with yet so but we're still all in this together so um, I, I wish I wish this department the best of luck I really do thank you and thank you for your presentation and I do want to make one comment if if anything um, if we feel, um, you know, the colleagues, and I know you will, if we have to have a, even a special meeting or, or call anything or file a resolve to have a meeting to, so you can bring us up to speed, I know you're going to keep us up to speed because, as I just said, we're all in it together. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam President. Okay. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. I am going to ask some questions. Sure. And most of them are not really finance, financial because it's a guessing game right now, and I know how hard that uh, you, you and your staff and the mayor and the d state legislative delegation have been working, but it's a crystal ball at this point. I don't think they know what, the, what they're gonna do. My question's more about well, a couple things, and they're more educational. How much damage do you think this last six months or four, three months has done to kids in general educationally? Uh, um. Are they... Uh, it's done a lot of damage, uh, especially social and emotional. That's been our number one focus for our students because um, students belong in school with their friends and their teachers. Uh, they need the routine, the structure, uh, all kids. But they, this is, you know, a lot of our kids have suffered with trauma. Um, they've had family members that have died of this horrific disease. Uh, and then you add in the George Floyd murder, um, our kids have suffered a lot of trauma. <coughs> And um, we knew you did, and we're, we're gearing up our summer programs to, to um, really focus on the social and emotional needs of our, of our students. Uh, I think eventually it is when we, when we get back to school, uh, I think we just will have to start the first three months, get back to the basics, 
um, like the old days and really you know, do a lot of remedial work to, to bring students you know, back up to speed. Uh, that's why I hope the state kind of re relaxes the testing requirements for next year as well, because I think we need to spend time on getting back the basics with the students so we can get them back into school. But it's the social and emotional uh, wear and tear that it's taken on students and families. That's what we need to focus on. Um, even though we had to cut positions, not one adjustment counselor or guidance counselor or mentor position was cut in this budget because that's how important it is for us to support our students because that I think is the biggest, the biggest hit that we took was the social emotional part. Yeah. So, but you don't think we've lost these kids? I mean, will they, uh, um, are yeah, they gonna I mean, be, uh, are they gonna be promoted? They are being promoted. Um, as we had a grading policy that we, um, right away, the school committee, myself, we were not going to fail any student during this closure. We had a no, no failure. Uh, and if a student was not engaged, we tried, again, to give as much support as possible. Uh, if they weren't engaged, they ended up getting an incomplete. Mm -hmm. So those students get, that got an incomplete will we'll sp we'll spend time with them this summer. If a parent reaches out and they really want to keep their student back, obviously we will do that and work with the family. Um, we're going to try to put some extra remedial programs in next year, and that's what stinks about a bad budget because you can't build in a lot of remedial programs that cost money. Um, but we have to do what we can to help these students get back. So, yes, we, we've had a few parents reach out and ask for retention, which obviously we will do uh, to support them and their, ch and their, ch their children. So um, there's a lot of things we have to put in place to, to work with our families to get our students back up to par. Um, no, it's been. This is not. I. This is not a good situation. No, it's problems. been bad on every facet of life, but I think on on the educational system, it's the worst effect. Absolutely. Anywhere because kids don't have. It's not like you just miss some work and and even people who got laid off got some. You know, financially got some help. We hope and all, but when you miss a year of school, you're only a third grader once or a fifth grader once or. The real kids who suffered some of those things are the seniors. I mean, absolutely. You know, and it's all up. again, like you said, the seniors missed everything. They're missed wrong, everything. Their, their senior week, their all the fun activities, and, and all the students that you know that the, the, the spring and summer, it's it's when the MCAS testing's over. That's you know they, they're done, they, they, and they love being in school, and there's a lot right. of fun activities for them, and their field trips. They missed all that. Yeah, and it's just a horrible situation for it kids. Is. Awful. If the governor doesn't change, uh, as of right now, they're talking about how many kids in the classroom? Well, that the summer uh, well, guidelines. Well, no, I'm talking the fall. They, they, they do not have a number out for that. So the summer they're not guidelines are 10 to 1. Um, that is not the um, guidelines that we have right now for uh, September. Because Those we would have to go into, tomorrow. we would have to go to double sessions Absolutely. at least. Absolutely, yep. Or every other day, or, I mean, and, and none of that would work for kids. Um, and so That's just if, asking if, for if trouble. If the guidelines stay like they are now for summer, we would it would be you know we would again have to do double sessions um, or every other day or things like. And that. not just at the high school, but oh, all schools. All yeah, schools. I mean the one thing about we have large schools. Uh, the George School is a thousand. The Davis School is twelve hundred. Um, you know the Raymond is seven hundred. The Baker is nine fifty. So we have very large large buildings. Now is that a good thing or a bad thing in this case? The space is a good thing, um, but the numbers are, are high. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what they come up with the guidelines. There's a lot of work to do. Because double sessions doesn't double your cost, but it, it'll, I mean, the teachers would be the same, but it takes away essentially every social and uh, you'd have no fine arts, basically, and um, uh, none of the extracurricular, let me rephrase that, extracurricular. Probably the, a lot of the extracurricular, which we're waiting on um, guidance from the MIA, what they're going to do with a lot of the sports this fall. Yeah. They haven't decided on that yet either. A lot of the things that keep kids in school. Exactly. Yeah, and keep them engaged. And yeah. So that's, uh, again, the, the not actual budget questions because no, there's really, I think you've done a great job with, with what, the way, I mean, the fact that it's uh, basically level funded is amazing. The problem is it's going to cost a lot more than l just to level educate. It's going to cost a lot more than level funding now because it, it's it's a, a, a new game. Absolutely. And that's why um, the lawsuit can't go away. That has right. to be kept on the, on the front burner, right. uh, not especially if they don't do anything with the Student Opportunity Act money. Um, that's the school committee has informed me to 
make sure we contact the attorneys again along with the mayor and um, you know we have to file we'll, fi we'll, we'll file I mean yeah. this is not the time to be cutting education especially in the gateway cities right so and then all those computers came from w our, our, our um, inventory so basically we have we had about 11,000 computers total throughout the district. As I said, we're not a one-to-one -one district. So um, we loaned out 6,500. Um, Aldo and Troy are really working hard with Plymouth County. Well, that, sure uh, that's that my next question. Uh, actually, they're putting in for uh, purchase of, I think, one for every student. <laughs> Pretty. I mean, we, we're going after... We actually have to buy those they're first. They're going and after then 16, almost 17,000 computers, so we can become a one-to-one -one district. In, Oh, good. There's something good coming out of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aldo and Troy and the mayor are not going to leave any stone unturned with the county money. Um, and that's desperately needed to get our district where it needs to be as far as technology. And I'm just wondering, I've been watching a lot of your YouTube, uh, your Zoom meetings, too. Did you have trouble finding your shirt and tie like I did this week? I've yes. been in golf yeah, shirts. Yeah, I was. For, yes. been in golf <laughs> shirts for... Uh, been in the back of the closet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you've done a great job. Um, I don't know where we're going to be in the spring. I mean, in the fall. But uh, let's let's all pray that it's uh, because I think this is the the single place where the most effect, most <laughs> long term effect is, and we need to need to do everything we can to. I mean, double sessions would be a killer for our kids. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, madam. Councilor Fowler. Thank you, madam chair. Uh, welcome, Mr. Superintendent. Let it never be said that. You and the school committee don't provide a comprehensive, fact-based, data-driven budget request. Uh, I may have to rent space at Iron Mountain at some point uh, with all of these. Uh, the, the letter from Vice Chair D'Agostino was very helpful. And I know there's been a great deal of interest in the public about the actual 64 certified staff that were reduced. But of those, 24 were actual layoffs. What programs did we lose? and? I assume, uh, or hopefully you'll confirm, that if we do get extra funding, those would be the, the first programs restored. Absolutely. So if you could expand on that a little bit. So um, out of those um, 24, um, what we did, and usually when we have to lay off, we lay off, um, so say there's 24 layoffs, and we, then we, we actually have to ask the school committee for almost 75 pink slips, because um, people bump each other. So you have to over pink slip. This year, we took a different approach and actually went through um, each, and, and teachers are put into, obviously, the subject, and the seniority list is by the subjects they teach. So we went through, and um, we had teachers hired that were hired during the school year after September. So we looked at positions that weren't going to bump other people out that had more years of service, so that's how we were able to keep it at 24 and not ask for 50 or 75 pink slips. We did lay off more, um, not all, but um, seven of these are phys ed teachers, um, which was hard. I was a phys ed teacher, so, um, but we don't know what the gym is going to look like in, in the fall. We had uh, four music teachers, four art teachers, um, four health, um, and then the rest were um, classroom teachers based on where we saw um, where the class size was low. Um, so those, that's how we picked the 24 positions. But again, every one of them is needed, um, even in the gym, because that's going to be a space that is going to be used for social distancing. So these are positions that all have to come back. Um, but that's the way we selected the positions to kind of <coughs> not disrupt the system. Because over the years, when we've laid off and you end up laying off 75 to 100, those people end up bumping into other buildings because people have dual certifications. So I could have been a third grade teacher at the Baker, but I'm also certified at the high school, so now I'm, I might not have taught high school for the last 15 years, but now because of the bumping, I'm at the high school when I'm teaching a freshman math class, and I've been teaching third grade for the last 15 years. So we try to avoid that with these cuts. So that's kind of my next question. If we get news early enough, we'll be able to offset the layoffs, offset the bumping, so we'll actually get people back to where they probably want to be and where they've been, so that some kid that, and I know it sounds strange, but I know when my kids went through the Whitman School, they always looked forward to going up a grade, and they, they knew who their teacher was going to be. They couldn't wait to be there with her, and, and, and I know a lot of kids are like that, and families. So 
that's another reason why I asked about the priorities. We'd get, we'd get the funding, we'd negate the layoffs, and we'd get people back to where they originally were assigned, and that minimizes disruption in families. Exactly, and, and the quicker we can call them back, that's why I'm hoping that the state comes out with a chapter 70 number soon, because as you know, we're self-insured, so all that, um, you know, that, that's unemployment costs okay. that we want to make sure we hire that 24 first back so we stop paying unemployment, and then we look at the other retirements, and then obviously we select those for the most need, which would be um, class size. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I had a, just a couple of things, but I did want to start off by saying, you know, uh, I, I was able to experience uh, some of you know what the, what the school department had to do with the learning from home. My sister's a junior at the uh, the high school, um, and I, I have to hand it to you know the Brockton Public Schools administration. Uh, you know, they do outstanding work. Our outstanding school committee. Uh, you know, our teachers, administrators, uh, everything. You know, down to the the parents and the students. And you know, I think everyone really came together. And uh, given the circumstances, it you know handled it really well uh, so I got to give you guys a lot of credit for that um, you know in, in regarding you know some of the other things that are, are challenging you know the, the the whole country today issues like uh, the, the George Floyd murder things like that uh, I think uh, Brockton Public Schools and being a Brockton Public School student offers a uh, profound um, you know, profound advantage you know the, the kids who go through there because our our schools are so diverse um, that I think it really helps people understand that you know there's there's no difference you know based on based on how you look that's not that's not what people should be operating off of uh, so I you know I think that's another thing that Brockton you know I, I think everywhere is going to work on addressing and uh, you know addressing this and and talking more about it and turning the spotlight on it, but I think Brockton does have a, uh, a step ahead. Um, I, I just have, you know, one, one question. Have you heard anything from the state? I know that, you know, when, when, our, when students go to, you know, the charter school, another school like that, and we don't get that, uh, that money from the state, uh, that's decided in October, if I'm correct. I, yep, yeah, exactly. will, will the state give us some more time you know, if students come back from the charter school, they, we all go back to school and they find that, you know, the charter school has not handled the transition in the way they would like and they want them to go to Brockton. Will they give us more, more of a window? Will they extend it past October? Not at this time. They, under the, the change of the Student Opportunity Act, they did stick to the October 1st date for enrollment count, so they did not. They did do a little bit better on charter school reimbursement, correct? They, did, they increased it. They increased the charter school reimbursement back to okay. schools, which is, would helped us, but um, they did not change the October first date. Okay, well at least they at least they did that. Um, yeah, and I'm not gonna drag it on. I know you guys are no, thank you. I get while, but I, I did the staff how hard they worked to switch over to remote learning. And as far as diversity and inclusion, we have a lot of work to do in that area. I mean, that's yeah. there's no oh, yeah. um, there's no secret. We have a lot of work to do. We have to do a better job training. Um, our teachers um, and our administrators, making sure that um, you know that we you know th we know diversity sensitivity training, um, people calling out things when they think racism happens, we have to all speak up, obviously, and I have to do that as a leader of the school system. Um, that's my number one job, and we have to do a better job with diversity and inclusion training, and also identifying when there's issues and when things are said to people that need to be called out. Um, and that, that starts with me, and um, we have to do a much better job of that in the school system. And that's why it's so unfortunate about, with 93 positions, we have a grant from the state to improve diversity amongst our workforce. Um, we have four Inspire Fellows uh, with the school department, and I, we, I started a program with our paras and MTA. We had 70 of them that were meeting with me monthly. Uh, we, were, we were starting uh, MTEL prep courses at the high school so they didn't have to travel around the state. Um, and th those were who we were going to, uh, paras and MTAs, which is a very diverse group, you know, we're going to become our next teachers. Uh, we have Bridgewater State, Sydney Marrow set up at the high school to help bring, you know, our students over to Bridgewater State to become teachers. So 
Um, that's what's so unfortunate about, but, about the layoffs. But um, diversity and inclusion is we have to do a much better job, and we also have to do a much better job with our curriculum. We have to make sure our curriculum is um, where it needs to be to reflect um, the history of the country. Um, and we have to make sure that we do a good job with watching our curriculum for bias. Uh, and that's another thing we have to make sure we do. But it is, it is good to know that, you know, you guys know what you got to do. And, you know, you've had, you have an administration and a school committee that is prepared to do it. Um, and, you know, with, with this, uh, with this fight, with the budget fight, with dealing with the state, um, you know, I think it goes without saying, but I will say it. Uh, the, I believe the council has shown themselves to be, uh, you know, more than a, a willing partner uh, in this. You know, the schools are your domain. You have the ball. Uh, and we're here to help. But I, I appreciate you coming out and you. providing us with the information. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. All set, Councilor. Councilor Thompson. Good evening, Mr. Superintendent. Um, uh, I want to first say thank you for your leadership uh, throughout this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, you really have um, been amazing. Uh, when, the fir when this uh, first happened and everybody was scrambling, you still personally took the time to help me and uh, some of my constituents with uh, food and laptop issues. So that's uh, much appreciated. So thank you for that, sir. Um, my first question was gonna be about the CARES Act. So uh, I'm glad uh, Councilor uh, Cruz brought that up. So, and I'm also glad to hear that there's gonna be an ask uh, made to um, the Plymouth County uh, to fund uh, some of the uh, technology that we're gonna need if we find ourselves in a position where um, more online learning is, is gonna have to happen. I think that's gonna happen regardless. So, um, and, and even if we all went back to school, I think um, we now understand that there is a place uh, for online learning in our uh, public schools. So um, I, I'm glad we'll continue walking down that road. So I guess my, my second question would be about uh, advocacy at the uh, city at, on the city level uh, to the state uh, regarding the, the cut uh, for the Student Opportunity Act. Um, I, I know there obviously there will be a cut and, and my hope that it's an equitable cut and not an equal cut. And so I'm just wondering what's, um, what, what's the city doing on, on our level to advocate for such an equitable cut um, and, and not uh, equal cut? So the, um, the school committee, along with the mayor, uh, along with several gateway city school committees, and mayors and superintendents just sent a letter, and I shall forward that to the council um, tomorrow. Um, it was sent, Chelsea started putting it together. Uh, they were part of uh, the group that we were working with over the last couple of years to file the lawsuit. So they sent a letter to the governor, the chair of the House Ways and Means, um, talking about the Student Opportunity Act, putting in actually um, suggestions on how to fund it and how important it's gonna be for what the closing did to the gateway cities and how much it affected our students um, and that the, the need for them to make sure that they fund the Student Opportunity Act as best they can. Um, so we're, we're waiting, we're hoping. That we, the letter was sent, I think, on um, Saturday? Sunday. Sunday, Let, the letter was sent Sunday. I'll forward that to you. Um, and again, the mayor and I have a call every week with the state delegation. Um, we know that they're pushing uh, for you know, a decent Chapter 70 number and with also the Student Opportunity Act funds put back. Um, so again, we, we hope to, that money comes through with some, you know, some sort to help us out, but if it doesn't, we really have to consider you know, filing the lawsuit because you know, this is not the time to be cutting the gateway cities. It's just, it's just not, it, it just can't happen. It can't happen. Agreed. It's immoral, actually, for them to even consider it. Agreed, and I, I hope that uh, through that advocacy and um, that the cut is not as bad as we currently imagine. Um, we, we need teachers, we need the MTLs, we need the paraprofessionals. Uh, that's what keeps our Absolutely. kids on track. And so um, <clears throat> praying that it's not as bad as we foresee. Exactly, and I know the state delegation, again, we meet them, they've been, they've been pushing and pushing. So we'll hope, again, we hope we get some good news in the next few weeks. And thank you again for your leadership, you. Mr. Thank Superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Thompson. Councilor Thompson, Councilor um, Cardoso. Good evening, Mike. I call you Mike because I consider you a good friend. I can't even call you Soup. soup. Uh, and good evening to the school committee. Uh, you guys have done a fabulous job. 
I want to thank you, Mike, for all of the, your efforts during the COVID-19, disseminating information in different languages and just keeping uh, parents informed. And uh, I think you did a fabulous job in that area. I appreciate it. And I am so upset with Councillor Cruz because he stole my thunder tonight. He did it last night as well. I think something's going on with years. this glass. He's <laughs> reading my mind through this uh, <laughs> plexiglass. Um, just to speak a little bit more about the damages, I feel like there's so much work to be done. As someone who's in a community and working with other folks in a community to try to help parents access resources, I can tell you it was devastating the amount of work that, you know, the COVID-19 showed us that already exi existed and then was further exacerbated by the, um, the pandemic. So, and you know firsthand, I, like Councillor Thompson, have called you to help yeah. parents with computers and parents who weren't even, you know, some were charter school kids <laughs> that were calling and needed help. Um, <laughs> Not to just the charter schools. <laughs> um, so, you know, you were always there for us, and we thank you. And there's just so much more work to be done. There's a lot of damage, and right now is not the time for us to lose funding. So I was going to ask you, when do we start to fight? And I think you answered it a little bit with the letter that you just stated went out on Sunday. Um, and then the other question I have was around the computers, which I think you, you answered, that we have families that um, receive one computer and they have two or three kids and it's impossible for, for them to get their work done. Um, so we wanna make sure each child gets a computer um, in the schools and you know, just the, the support that the teachers are gonna need going back with all the uh, social emotional you know, issues that these kids uh, have and all the dom domestic violence issues that you know, we haven't, the teachers are the first ones to identify a lot of these problems and they haven't been able to do that. So there's, there's just a lot of damage and a lot of work to be done and I just hope that we get this money. We have to fight for it m now more than ever. So thank you, thank you school committee members. And, and to your point, um, we talk about remote learning and how much the teachers didn't have the professional development because we just haven't provided it because that's what we kept cutting. But when you put a remote learning plan in place the right way, um, you do training for the, the families as well because right. you know, they're home helping their children, but you know, it's like, well, what do I do? How do I navigate? through all these online learning programs so in the learning platform so not only did our teachers have a lack of training because it's been cut when you put a, 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 a if you lay it out and do everything the right way you would then have forums for parents you know and you would have nights at the schools where they would come in right and you would train and when, them as well to right. how to support their children on with online learning because that's how it's supposed to be done the right way. And that's right. the issue when you're cutting cutting technology, you don't have those opportunities. Right, and we lost North Junior High, our community center, yeah. where if we had some, you know, a place where parents could come. I wanna shout out um, Lenny Montero and Sabuda, because they helped a lot of parents in the city you know, um, with accessing online learning, a lot of the Cape Verdean parents who didn't know how to navigate that system. Um, but we didn't have a space where we could help parents with yeah. that, so that was a huge challenge. So, you know, shout out to all the parents, the teachers, and everybody in the community that tried hard to help during this time. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. All set, Councilor Cardoso. Thank you. Councilor Mendez. Hello. Hi. So, I have um, some questions regarding that chapter funding money. What? How, what is the percentage in the budget that we really count, just because I'm still new, um, so I just want to make sure that uh, I understand. It's about, we, we're 85%. So 85% is the, by? Yes, 80%, I'm sorry, 80%. 80%. 80% of our budget comes from chapter 70 of the state. And at this point, we don't know anything. No, other, no, there's no number. Um, they, again, um, they've been talking about level services minus 5%. Uh, some of them, had, some communities have gone level services minus 10%. Um, that wasn't what we were hearing. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to other superintendents. The mayor was on calls with other mayors constantly. Um, so I think, you know, thanks to the mayor, Troy and Aldo, they came up with a, a number that I, I think we're, we're very confident in. But it, it's, it's frustrating that 
because I think they know the number, because I know they know the loss of revenues. They know what the projections are for um, where we're going. They have a rainy day fund. So I think, you know, knowing that we had a June 5th, and thanks to the BEA and, and, and President Kim Gibson, we had a May 15th deadline for, for RIF notices for, for our union members, our teachers. If they would have stuck with that date, we would have laid off probably three, 400 teachers mm -hmm. uh, back on May 15th. They extended that to June 12th. Uh, the state law is June 15th that all districts have to notify teachers. So uh, it's very frustrating that the state did not get us a number by June 15th um, and then put that many more public employees now joining, joining public uh, private sector employees in, on now the unemployment rolls, which we were hoping if we got a Chapter 70 number before June 15th, that would have kind of removed a lot of public sector and teachers going in on unemployment. But, you know, that's the unfortunate part. So we have no idea when we're going to get that number. I find it very irresponsible to make us go through all of this process and we don't even know what we're getting. Absolutely. And it gets the uh, residents very upset because to them, this is the law. This is what we're going to be going a whole fiscal year based on. And it's causing a lot of emotion because they already feel they've been, it's been a very tough school year uh, for everybody. So at this point, they're looking at us and they're like, you're cutting off, you're laying off teachers, that's when we need them the most, and that's when they should really be there for our students. So they just feel um, that everything that they've just been saying is just that the priorities, where's the priorities, and that's not the city fault. And I think it really needs to be made clear and be put on record that this is something that higher above the hierarchy, it's really coming directly from the state and that we're doing everything that we can under the circumstances. And I think that the school department is doing a fantastic job, but it's, it's just puts us in a very impossible situation. So I really praise you and everybody for doing and working, putting so much work into the budget for something that it's really, just a guessing game. So it's frustrating to say the least. It's very frustrating. And I don't get that frustrated very often. So in order for me to say this, it's really something that really want to let the residents know that we hear them. And it's not anything that we want to do or, or we're doing because we're not hearing their concern. It's really no other choice. This is the choice we're left with. But another question I have, just for clarification, that money that comes from Chapter 70, that is only for the net school spending. We also have the non-net school spending. And it breaks my heart to see all these big numbers because it's in the millions. And you also told us that even though we are seeing an 83.4% increase in that um, school buses and transportation, you also foresee that we're also gonna be short uh, possibly a million four hundred thirty-one thousand from what you're um, for this fiscal school year. My question is, how realistic do you think it would be for us as a city to start looking very seriously into the possibility of buying our own school buses? Because this is just a very huge number, and I, I can't believe that we can't purchase our own transportation and start seriously taking a look at this. I hear it's been said, but I don't see any action. So. It's so a lot of money. <laughs> school committee back, um, and I think it was um, right around when the governor's budget came out, um, we had a plan to buy eight. Uh, we were going to start phasing in buying our own, our own buses, or eight of them, correct? Eight. We were going to buy uh, two full-size um, buses and, and six vans uh, to basically oh, the start minibuses. the minibuses, they're called, um, to start doing our, our own, especially our homeless transportation, where it goes out of district, in our out-of-district transportation for our special ed students. Uh, we were going to start doing that in-house, and we actually had an uh, eight-year plan in place to continue to buy uh, buses. I mean, we had, we basically were getting close out, but we worked on it. I don't know if you want to jump up and tell them what the plan sure. was real quick. Sure. Well, when we began the process, um, we were talking to one bus company about buying one um, special ed van with a, you know, the lift on it that would help us with the students we have to move around a lot. And once we included the mayor in the conversation, the mayor said, why not buy six? So we started looking at six. Then when we got the cost, the cost really wasn't that much when you think about what a bus costs. The buses are around $85,000 each. Our contract is 86000 a year for the bus. Now that includes the driver. So then at that point the mayor said, well you know what, if we have extra money in snow and ice, let's look at 10 or 12. 
So the vendor who was on state contract was very happy, started running numbers for us, showing us propane versus gasoline versus diesel. So we had all the proposals together and the gasoline worked out to be the best. Honestly, we were probably two weeks away from handing them a purchase order when... <laughs> to, to make, to, to ask for. They have to approve the purchase. Yeah. Well, yes or no, we had some of the money in our budget. The first, the first couple of buses we had in our budget we were going to buy with that money. But then as the mayor, uh, the, the school committee um, started increasing the number, they said, well, if we have two large buses, we can move sports teams with them. If we have more of the smaller buses, we can do more smaller routes. So it started building up to the point where you know, uh, we did the financial trend uh, analysis of it and saw the payoff was huge. And um, the bus drivers, are all union job bus drivers, but um, it would work out as a great plan. So, and then this happened, so we had to put the brakes on for one year. But thank you for at least uh, start looking into the numbers and rest assured, I will be asking about this again and again and again until I see some of our own buses out there. Oh, it's absolutely. Because I really think it's gonna make a huge difference and we could be using that money for, for something else, it, it's it's something. But thank you for at least looking. And I agree with the mayor. Why not buy more buses? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. All set, councilor. Um, councilors, before we do a second round, anybody that hasn't asked any questions yet, oh, councilor Rodriguez. Well, I'm not going to ask any questions since nobody's asking any questions. <laughs> I'm just going to chime in and say what I want to say as well. <laughs> I'm going to become like councilor Aaron Airy. You know, speak your mind. Uh, but Mike, I, I just want to take a minute and just, uh, uh, again, voice what's already been said about your presence in the system. I think one of the things that we did uh, when I was still downstairs was to uh, select you to be the leader of this, uh, of this school system. I think you're the right choice. You got the right you know, temperament to do this. You got the right personality to do this. And I can't see uh, a person doing a better job with this COVID um, fiasco that we're going through than yourself because that's exactly what we need um, i know you can't be black white pink purple all at once but you know if i had to pick somebody i'd pick you just about any day uh, can, i know you and i had talked about uh, a little bit about the summer program some of the things that you wanted to do with the with the summer kids because i know we've been talking about the issues that are that we're going to be coming and seeing for the fact that these kids have been locked up all these months and things like that. Can you just take a few minutes and just talk sure. to us a little bit about the summer program of some of the things that you want to do? Sure. So right now we're working on eight locations to have outside summer programs um, that will be staffed with mentors, for, with adjustment counselors, teachers, um, also someone with recreation so we can break the students up into stations and have 10 at a time. Uh, we're going to have them located at uh, eight of the lunch the grab and go locations. Um, again, they'll be all outside, so it's uh, it's safe, um, and also the students are there to eat. Um, and we're gonna the, the students have been uh, identified or are being identified by through their adjustment counselors, um, through the principals of students that, again, have need the social and emotional support. Um, a lot of students um, will still do some virtual summer school, uh, but the kids that really need the uh, social and emotional support we're going to target to come and, and take part in the summer program. So uh, we look at using uh, and spread out the eight locations across um, the city. Uh, so uh, it's easy for parents to get the, their, um, you know, their child to it or, or the um, child can walk to the location because obviously we can't have transportation. So um, we're looking to do that and welcome as many kids as we possibly can. Um, we might have to do like a morning session and an after afternoon session if obviously the numbers get high. But we're hoping to have at least six to seven staff members at every site so we can service up to 60 to 70 students. Um, and if that has to be a morning session for two and a half hours and then an afternoon session, we're looking to run it from 9, 9 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. in, um, you know, throughout the day. And then obviously they can eat lunch right on the right on the spot. So that's very important to have. And again, it was very important. And I worked with the mayor. We worked with our summer school staff. I'm working with the Y as well. Um, we're working with some of the, the agencies. And, and I always, Tina, help me with the name, with Sab <laughs> Sabora. I always, Sabura. I got to learn how to say that the right way. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're going to work with us. The Cape Verdean so Association is going to work with us on a, a summer program. So that's the great thing about um, the community center and about, because um, they, those are some of the programs that have been running with, uh, for us for a long time. And um, 
We're going to continue that this year. Um, so the support of the community agencies for, um, for this summer is going to be huge as well. So again, it's very important, like you said, for the students to actually have that face-to-face -face contact. Uh, it's all going to be done safely um, through the guidelines that are laid out by the state. But it's something we had to do. We couldn't keep a virtual summer program. I mean, it's, it works for some kids, and that will continue for the kids it works with, but the kids that need the in-person face-to-face contract, we're definitely going to follow through with. Right. And uh, how are you going to pay for that? We're actually going to charge it back to uh, Plymouth County. <laughs> <laughs> COVID-19 oh, money. You know what? They, COVID wanted, the, they wanted the money, so absolutely. they better, and, they better um, stop paying up. Absolutely. <laughs> but again, I just want to thank you for your leadership and please continue to do what you do for I really our school system. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rodriguez. Um, Councillor Monahan. Thank you. Good evening, Mike. I already talked to you today already. And that's why I don't really ask a lot of questions. I usually call people, <laughs> call these guys up before we get to the meetings and get my answers. But uh, and I just want to say I see the frustrations with our new councillors and what they're feeling. and. and I just want to, once this is over, I think with Mike in there and the staff and the school committee, you're going to really see a great school system and really explode with all this extra money, getting the money that we need before. So just to the new councilors, people at home, uh, don't get so upset about it. Don't, don't be worried. All these programs that we want, we're going to be getting them through Mike and school committee, uh, even Aldo, right, Aldo? going to come up with that money. But I think we got a bright future in Brockton as far as our school department. It's always been great with this extra money that we should be getting. We have been fighting uh, for years, the councils that have been here with the lawsuits. I mean, I've been here, this is my 11th year. But even back then, always going after the state, our state delegation, and we're going to keep on it. And with, with Mike in here, I'm so happy you are the school superintendent. Uh, I really uh, think we have a bright future. So. Don't get so frustrated. It's going to work out, and uh, next, maybe next year or two, you're going to see really great things happening. So, thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you, the school committee, and uh, thank you. I'll set Council Monahan, and I allow that because it wasn't actually a budget question, but we let it slide. <laughs> um, councilors, any other questions? That councilors that haven't asked any questions from the superintendent. No, nope. Councilor Ianieri. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. I'm only going to be just uh, one second because I think um, one of the uh, nicest things that we heard about today and when I did call Aldo uh, Petronio this morning, uh, my first question out of my mouth was, where are we at with the Huntington School uh, roof? And I had all nervousness in my head and stomach to the fact that we were going to be put off, but we weren't. And I think it's very nice that um, you know, Aldo gave me a copy of uh, the letter indicating that that um, program has been uh, that program has been uh, authorized by the MSBA and uh, voted to approve to um, to maintain to the accelerated repair project, which is the proposed project, the city of Brockton, and, and for a roof replacement at the Huntington Alternative School, which I believe we put in for last year, if I'm not mistaken. And I do want to um, thank, uh, as always, uh, the Ward 3 School Committee member, Mark DiGostino and I, DiGostino and, and I, and as the City Council, we always have worked closely together on any projects, and this one as well. So um, it, it's a positive, and it, it's nice to see there's some, some other things that still need to be done, but we're going to get like $2 million, 84, 6, 12, and it could go up a little bit based upon some other things. but. Um, it, it looks like it's, it's definitely a go, and uh, I think that's what's that's what definitely going to be a good uh, asset to that building because now we're able to keep it still as a building for X amount of years because of this project. Am I correct, Mike? That's how it works. Absolutely. Right. So, which I'm pleased to see because the Huntington School is still a gem. It's just a gem to the Campello and that that Warren Avenue um, area to to the uh, Ward Three into that particular neighborhood. Um, and, and I hope that we are able to, to do that and we don't even know we could even be using it for some other things next year because of what we got going. But at least that's a, that's a, light, a nice positive to know um, that something's coming our way and that that's being taken care of. Um, and, I, and I appreciate all the, all the work that uh, you and, and Aldo and the school committee did and we did as a city council as well, um, the mayor as well, and uh, make sure that this has happened. So, I guess we can leave with a smile on that one anyways tonight. Oh, yeah, not, and then the, the city council is always, um, uh, we, I've been to the, here with several MSBA projects since 2010, and you've approved every one of them. Thank you. So, um, 
so we I think that's over sixty million dollars in funding <coughs> from the state for several roofs and boilers and uh, window projects and every time we've come before you you've supported and, those and, and you know actions. mike the, it, i still look at you and still can see see you in the gym at east junior high school when you were just the, the phys ed uh, about the phys ed teacher ago. yeah yeah what whatever <laughs> but i mean uh, I, I love it when an east side boy does well to be truthful oh, yeah. with you so and you did so um that's why we got you here <laughs> you're not going nowhere all right thank you thank, thank you, you madam president thank you counselor and Eric. counselor cruz well, actually, I guess great minds think alike. I was actually, with everything that's gone on, I know the focus is all on the remote learning and everything, but where are we on some of the, like, north now? Are we going to put on the back burner doing yeah, any work up yeah, there? Yeah, so we were actually, we're actually going to keep it open for just, the, um, we're going to let sixth graders go back to north and yeah. um, for help with help with social distancing. Uh, we are going to keep the community center there um, for next year as well. Um, and that's so we're going to renovate our uh, in-house renovation and, you know do a lot of cosmetic work ceilings carpets paint lighting um, to obviously dress dress it up um, we can't do the full renovation of the elevator and the sprinkler system and those things but again it's still a viable building it was not condemned it was just a needed a need a needed cosmetic and it needed some work but it's important to keep it open because again it's a big school um, and we needed it for the space and those renovations as well is going to be charged back to the county uh, because we need to op keep the building open for due to COVID-19. COVID. So because those, again, those all those kids would have, that would have been the, this was the last year of North being open, then right. we were going to start the renovation, but it was important to keep it open and that was a decision by the school committee, which was a great decision to. And you may have uh, to move more kids into it. Exactly, yeah, exactly, depending on what the guidelines say. And then uh, any work towards the, I mean, I don't think we did, did anything with the MSBA on the, the high school, but we did. Uh, it's the applications in. Yeah. Uh, you approved that um, um, back in, I think that was January as well. Um, so the application has been submitted. They're probably delayed. They usually come out and visit the school in the fall. They're going to probably be delayed a few months. So I would expect that they probably would come visit. They send a team of architects. Probably will be January instead of November. Uh, they'll evaluate it, then they make, then it goes to their board, and they decide whether to welcome it into um, their program, um, and would know that. I'm saying we'll probably know that by February, next February. So all those things are still moving That's forward. That's still moving forward, yes. Okay, good. And and the word is the MSBA did get some of the CARES Act money um, to help fund renovations for schools uh, in the first in the first CARES Act money bill. I think the MSBA got a decent amount of money, and I think. Um, if there's another stimulus package um, focused a little bit on infrastructure, they'll get some more. <coughs> so it could help us. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, thank you. Counselor, counselor counselors, any other questions for our superintendent? Um, no, I would personally like to thank you and the school committee members for the budget that you presented to us with, uh, with the mayor. And um, I have to say, Brockton always makes me proud. I have a rising senior and um, very proud of what you've done and all of our students. They make us proud, you make us proud. So um, we've dealt with this COVID-19, you've dealt with it very well and so have the students. We're proud of them and we're proud of our seniors. Congratulations to all of them. I heard that you have the graduation yeah, can, news. Yes, so. let me go over. Um, Mayor, was that what you were going to mention? Yes. I saw you stand up. Thank you. So this, um, this Saturday is the virtual uh, celebration. Uh, the Huntington, uh, this will be on BCA and also be streaming on uh, YouTube. So the Huntington will graduate at 4 p.m. on BCA. Um, the Champion, which will be the key, uh, the key center, the Champion and the um, Frederick Douglass Academy will be at 5 p.m. And then Brockton High School virtual graduation will be at 6 p.m. And then thanks to the mayor um, and the school committee for continuing the conversation um, for a physical graduation. Um, which didn't look possible early, um, but they, we continued to talk about it and it stayed as a priority. Uh, and then the state released guidelines that um, if you can graduate, you can do a physical graduation after July 19th. That's the date they gave us. So um, Friday, July, and this will all be at Marciano Stadium, obviously done safely uh, with social distancing. Friday, July 24th at 5 p.m., will be the Huntington, the uh, Frederick Douglass Academy, and the Champion will graduate that night. 
uh, on the field. On Saturday, July 25th, the Brockton High School Yellow Building will be at 10 a.m. The Brockton High School Green Building will be at 1 p.m. And this, you'll, I'll get this in an email as well. And then the Edison Academy will be at 3 p.m. on that Saturday. And then on Sunday, July 26th, will be the Brockton High School Red Building at 10. The Brockton High School Azure Building will be at 1. And the second graduation for Edison will be at 3 p.m. So that will be a physical graduation weekend of uh, July 24th, 25th, and 26th, and we'll get plenty of uh, messages out about that. Perfect, thank you, and yes, you do get, I know you're sending messages out to parents via emails, text messages, on uh, your website, on the city website, so the information is out there for parents and students. But once again, you all make us proud. We have some of the most amazing teachers, students, and of course, administrators, so thank, thank you, you for all you do. Thank you, councilors. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, did you want to speak on? If I, if I could, Madam President, members of the uh, City Council. Um, uh, do you want to let Mateo wipe down the uh, mat, please? Uh, Thank you. Sorry, it's for your own safety. We're trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I have some councilors here that are kind of violating the, the <laughs> plexi and the six feet, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good evening again. I just, uh, I'll be really brief because I know you have a long night and I've sat up there. A um, couple things. Um, Council Mendez, we are definitely going to adhere to creating our own fleet of buses. We need to. It makes business sense, practical sense. That way we can control our own fiscal responsibility as we move forward. Uh, so that's, that's a pledge that we share. Um, one thing I just wanted to let you know, um, in terms of working with Mike Thomas, Mike was 1987 graduate of Brockton I, I was 88, I've known him a long time. He might have got an A in Spanish, when I get a B, I don't know, I have to check that, but <laughs> we're in the same class. Um, what you see is what you get with him. He's, he's an unbelievable guy. He's been a great partner to work with. We talk every single day. Uh, when COVID hit the city of Brockton, Mike and I met in the mayor's office, and we acted swiftly. We actually acted before Governor Baker did to protect the boys and girls in the Brockton Public Schools. On a Thursday, we made a declaration to close schools. It was the right thing to do, and I think it really, truly made a difference. Um, I reached out to Mike and said, Mike, because Brockton has such a diverse community with multiple languages, we need to get out pamphlets. We need to get out pamphlets. And I had spoken to Councilor Cardoza about this as well, and he said, what can I do? And I said, can we utilize the bilingual teachers to help us? And so we did 10,000 uh, documents. Uh, it was in Spanish and English, in Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole. We gave out 5,000 one week, 5,000 the next week at the 10 sites. Um, just last week, I wanted to make sure that the city council got the books, the beautiful books, the new budget books. And we were a little nervous, Troy and I, about the printer, the outside printer. I called Mike up. I said, Mike, I made a pledge to the council. We're in this together. Let's, let's get the books. He said, bring them over. We'll do some in-house. So we did some in-house. And we have some, and that's what we're giving out to other people as well. But the, the new books came in from the printer. Um, so the collaboration, the synergy is there. I'm not saying it's because he's a product of the Procton Public Schools, or I am, but it's also really the support of the city council and the school committee. School committee has spent hours and hours vetting this out. Subcommittee, <coughs> full school committee, uh, working with Troy, wor working with, with, with Aldo and Troy. Um, so again, this isn't what we want to be doing, any of us. Uh, but I have full faith and confidence in the leadership of Mike Thomas and all the Petronio and Dr. Moran, Dr. Jim Cobbs, uh, Sharon Wolder, Dr. Kinsell, June Saber McGuire. These are people that they get it. They know what we want to do. And the ultimate goal as elected officials is to make sure that Brockton prospers. So we're not going to be hesitant to file that lawsuit. When I sat up there with you, we authorized the money that actually initiated that lawsuit. And at that time, we had Worcester and Chelsea buy in and all the gateway communities. So I just want to look you in the eye right now and say, as a product of the Brockton Public Schools, as a dad that has two kids in the Brockton Public Schools, and as the mayor of the city of Brockton, we will not let that die. We owe it to the boys and girls. Remember, if Brockton kids count, they sure as hell do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, and class of 88 right here with you. That's so right. That's right. We're very, I think we have many uh, BHS graduates and Southeastern graduates in the room. So we're very proud of our school system. And it's good to hear that they, we have, um, and I'm sure everybody at home is happy to hear that they have our support and that we're supporting them. So thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, number four, seven. Weights and measures, Kevin Croker, Sealer. 
Thank you again to the school committee members that were here in support of the budget. <clears throat> okay. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Croker. So my opening statement, just like to thank uh, my assistant, Corey Quinlan, for all his help. And Troy's department, always been helpful. So with that, I'm open to any questions. Yep. Questions for weights and measures, counselors? Yep. Councilor Mendez. Hello. Can you just elaborate a little bit more what exactly your department uh, does and what are you responsible for doing in the city? So every year, every commercial weighing and measuring dice in the city is, has to be tested and sealed. Um, so that's kind of a short answer to your question. Um, taxi meters, oil trucks, gas stations, pharmacy scales, truck scales, um, to name a few. I mean, anything, almost every commercial weighing and measuring device in the city we're involved in a transaction, whether it's monetary or, you know, just something that we do throughout the city every day. And I was also reading on the descriptions that some of the things that your department did this year was also helping with the whole COVID-19 and the pandemic that hit us. Well, I think what that was referring to is they sent out a memo that everyone had to pass a test that you were aware of how to handle certain situations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, counselors? No questions, Mr. Croker? Oh, that's it. Well, thank you for being here this evening and have a wonder wonderful night. Thank you, guys. Appreciate thank you. It. Madam Clerk, number eight. Information Technology Center. William Santos, Acting Director. Good evening, Mr. Santos. Good evening, Council President. I just said, uh, I'm, I'm fairly level funded. I, I took on a, a, a couple of new responsibilities, so there are some changes on a couple of line items. Um, our overtime decreased by 20,000, and uh, our telephone increased uh, by probably about 75,000 or so, and uh, services increased by 74,000. And uh, the, so the, the shift in roles uh, for the telephones is that we used to pay and then each department in the auditor's office would, would charge back each department and pull uh, that back into our account, kind of reload it. And now um, all the funding for the cell phones will just be under IT. So that's, so it's kind of like a net zero. It, it's in my account now, but it's not in theirs as it, as it was. In, other years. Uh, and the increase in service um, repair and maintenance is primarily uh, the police department has a camera system and we maintain it, but it's never been funded. So, uh, and, and there are three new uh, munis agreements. Uh, one is the, uh, the GUI or, or the dashboard and um, a couple other small items in, in Munis that increased this year. Take any questions. Councilor Cardoso. Hi, Mr. Santos. I just have a question about um, any additional expenses um, due to COVID-19. I'm sorry? Additional expenses that could be reimbursed due to COVID-19. Yeah, sure. Do you know? Well, we, we've been working with Troy's office in weekly as the invoices come in, we've, we've purchased a lot of various things, tablets, um, small um, cameras with microphones built in for desktops, uh, things of that nature. So, and laptops as well uh, for the Board of Health and, and a few other people um, through City Hall for remote uh, access. 
and a lot of remote access devices. Right, that's what I'm thinking, so. Yeah, we... so each week um, we send a spreadsheet as the invoices come in. We don't send them until the invoices come in, even though some of them have been purchased two months ago. Um, some companies are so far behind because they've been overwhelmed, like Zoom, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's just, I purchased that from the beginning, and we still haven't seen an invoice. So he will get more, but uh, as they come in, we, we set up a spreadsheet and we send it to them and update them every week. Okay, thank you. Councilor Mendez. Hello. You have um, a vacancy. What position is that, and are you looking to hire someone to fill in that position? Yes, um, that is, um, that's a very important position. It's the, the one person uh, we have two uh, technical people that, that actually handle the desktop area of, of the city. We have 60 buildings to get to, and um, one person sits in on a help desk and calls and tries to work remotely and, and fix things, and he does probably 75, 80% of the calls. And you can do a lot more, you know, because you're in one place and you're remoting in, but the other person is, the person that I'm looking to hire is a technical support specialist that actually is boots on the ground. He goes out to the buildings when you just can't fix it remotely or a printer is dead or a computer, you know, got an electrical hit or something. Uh, and it's every day. It's, um, you know, City Hall is probably the biggest site, but um, all over the city. So uh, that's a very important uh, position to to uh, have open, so it's it's been tough without him for the last couple of months. Thank you. Any other questions, councilors, for Mr. Santos? With no other questions, I would like to thank you for you did supply us with tablets, and I hope that that gets funded with COVID-19 because it was yeah. because of um, COVID-19. So hopefully you put in for that reimbursement yes. for those. And I have to say with COVID-19, thank God we had technology because I don't know what we would have done if this was what, 20, 30, 25, 30 years ago or when we weren't so, things weren't as easily, um, you know, I, technology wasn't as available. So thank God for technology, even though it has its little glitches, but it um, it gets us, it gets the job done. So it's a learning curve for, for everyone. It is a learning curve for everybody, but thank you that with all you've done, I know you've helped me in many occasions, especially um, with meetings and answering my questions of what we can and we can't do technology wise, but, and thank you. And I know from day one, you had this phone installed here for us. Um, so thank you for all your support. With that, I think uh, have a wonderful evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number nine. License Commission, Henry Tartaglia, Chairman. We're just cleaning up the spot for you, Mr. Tataglia. Good evening, councilors. Good, Good evening. evening. Thank you for being here, considering you're on a volunteer board. So thank you for presenting this budget. Uh, it's mostly level offended, the uh, license commission. Last year, they took in approximately $289,000. Uh, I'll answer any questions if anybody has Counselors, any. Councilors, any questions for Mr. Tataglia? No, Councillor Thompson. Good evening, uh, Mr. Tataglia. It's always great to see you. Um, just quickly, uh, the Licensing Commission, um, are they meeting next month or when's their next uh, intended uh, yeah, we, meeting we board? Met this, uh, we had it on Zoom this, this month and uh, I, I'm trying to get it in the GAI room next month. We, uh, we'll meet every month now. And how's your, um, how, how's the agenda right now? Is it? You load it, or you, one session is all you need to catch up? Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Uh, Sylvia's doing a lot of work. She deserves a lot of credit. Uh, she can use a little help in uh, renewal time, too, because she's all by herself. You know what it is. You've been on a license commission, and uh, maybe if you guys can put a word in for us, we can get a little help at, at renewal time. Understood. <laughs> uh, and Sylvia has been great. I've, I've called her many times and she's always, um, you know, uh, available and uh, has an answer. So um, if you could pass along, I think she's doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. 
That's all, Madam President. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Tagliere? Council Cruz. Thank you. How are you? Good. How are Good you? to see you. You too. Um, we just passed an ordinance, uh, it hasn't gone through the third reading yet, but for the outdoor dining. Um, do you see any, pro I mean, you guys will have to set the rules for it once we pass it. Uh, right now it's in the COVID, the, the governor's got rules, but do you, do you see any issues with the, with us going forward on that? Or do you no. think you'll be able to, you think it's a good thing for the city? Absolutely. I think it's a great idea to have the outside dining uh, you know, every summer, uh, whenever you can have it outside, it's only going to help the businesses. And, uh, you know, right now, I don't even know how they're surviving, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I would be in, in favor of outside dining. Good. I just, so, before we finish that, I wanted to see how you felt about it, too. So, good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. All set, Councilor. Any other questions? Councilor Rodriguez. Mr. Tataglia, how are you? Good, Councillor. How are you? Um, as you know, uh, our city now is a marijuana city, and we've got some marijuana establishments being uh, opening up and that have opened in the city and will be will be opening up in the very near future. And one of the requirements is that the licensing commission is the overseer. Uh, we, the council, are the licensor of the licenses, but you folks in the uh, licensing commission are the enforcers of or the regulators of the licenses once they, once it's issued. Um, I know that you only have one clerk or one, um, one employee in the licensing commission. Yes. Do you see that one person being able to do the additional work that will be required to, um, to be done uh, once the, uh, all these marijuana places are open and, and functioning? Well, I think, like I said before, it, you know, it, it'll probably be mostly like renewal time. I think she could use some help, you know, maybe a couple months a year uh, or even a part-time help. Uh, I don't know what the regulations are. Uh, we haven't got them from the state yet on, on, a, uh, on a marijuana license. In other words, we haven't got the regulations, so I don't know how complex it's going to be. Uh, I think that there's going to be like, uh, if, if it goes to the whole city, I think, what, eight licenses or something like that? Yes. So that I don't see as a problem, you know, getting the licenses out and collecting the money. Uh, we have um, police officers that, you know, will oversee it that, that's uh, on the license commission, you know, in case we have a problem. But, yeah, I think she could use a, a part-time help anyway in that. I mean, it's, it's a one-person office handling uh, used cars. It's, you, know, you know what I mean? You're handling used cars. You're handling food. You're handling lodging houses. Uh, I think there's a couple more that I probably forgot about. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, Sylvia could use some help. But the day-to-day, -day, uh, in terms of making sure that these these establishments are functioning the way they're supposed to, at least in the law that we wrote, gives the authority back to the licensing commission to uh, to basically regulate and making sure that they're being enforced. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is, uh, you know, reports will be coming to you, and it's up to you folks to basically stay on top of the uh, of those establishments to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So that's. The reason why I keep bringing that up, and because I brought that up before, I believe, I think it was last year when we were first talking about this, and here we are again, um, and we've got about five or six licenses coming up, and these places will be opening up, and uh, we should be up and running to make sure that um, that, that department is function, functioning the way it should. So what, what discussions have you had with, uh, with the administration in terms of uh, making sure that that position is uh, well, to be honest building. with you, uh, uh, we just learned that it's going to, you know, that we're going to be overseeing the, uh, the marijuana. We knew the council was going to award the licenses. Uh, I haven't had time really to talk to the mayor. I was going to plan on talking to him this week because the city hall has been closed. And uh, believe it or not, you know, uh, I tried to get in a couple of times. I couldn't get in. I mean, not that they said no, but I mean, I... I didn't want to bother anybody, but I'm going to get together with the, uh, the mayor, and I'm going to have uh, 
uh, I'm going to call uh, to the state too to find out, you know, get all the regulations and so that we can enforce and so we know what would, you know, what, what to enforce. Well, I think our, the ordinance that we put together, in, at least in this body, is uh, pretty inclusive in the sense I think if you just uh, get hold of that and it'll give you some uh, insights exactly how to go about doing that. But in addition, uh, we are in the process of reviewing about six different licenses, uh, probably within the next week or so. Uh, and I think they're in the final stages of approval. So once we approve those, these businesses are up and running. So I think you need to have that discussion with the mayor sooner than later. Yes, I'm going to have it this week. Uh, you know, if he's not too busy, I'm going to try to get in this week, uh, you know, early next week. Uh, We'll get it done, though. I, I, I can assure you that it'll, it'll be done right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tadaglia. Okay. Sorry, my mask is stuck on my earring. Any other questions for Mr. Tadaglia? No? Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for waiting this time. <laughs> um, and have a wonderful evening, Mr. Tadaglia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Moody. <laughs> Madam Clerk, number 10. Park Commission, Timothy W. Carpenter, Superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent. How are you this evening? Fine, thank you, uh, Madam President. You have a statement for the... Uh, as it's late, I'll be actually... Uh, a little more brief than I normally am, but uh, as I normally do, I would like to take this time to uh, thank my team for what has been a successful and difficult year. Um, their dedication has led to great successes uh, and improvements to all our parks, playgrounds, DW Field Golf Course, and the customer service in which my office provides. At this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilor Mendez. Hello, good evening. Good evening. I want to thank you very much for taking care of the gates for me at the DW Fields Park. I'm in there every morning and it drives me crazy when it's before 10 a.m. and the gates are already open and I know and I see that people are the ones who are opening the gates and then once they go through another gate, that one is closed and then they go through the wrong way. It just mess. but uh, after, I, I think now it's been um, better. My question for you is, what would it take in order for that um, park to be paved and if there's any grants available that we would be able to apply for in order to address some of the pavement because it really needs, it's really bad. I would agree with you. Um, you know, we have looked into certain grants. Um, you know, we were hoping the possibility of getting some federal funding to help out with that as well. Uh, I think in light of what's happened in the past couple of months, I think that federal funding's probably pretty well dried up. Uh, but we'll continue to search, and I, and, I, and I think you're right, especially coming in off of South Street, that first little section there is pretty rough. I think that is a treasure that the city has, so we really need to take good care of it because I don't find many other cities out there that really has a park like that. So I'm um, very happy. Overall, it's clean, and I see um, the workers there in the morning picking up the trash. and doing the, So everything is doing great. It's really just the conditions of the road is really, really bad. The other question I had regarding your budget, what would that revenue be for that $139,600? Because there wasn't anything estimated for the previous year. So what, what is that money oh, coming that's from? that's the leftover capital money? Is that, is that 139 was the leftover? Oh, it's, yeah, page 349. So it's the revenue or the Department of Revenue. So I believe that is the amount that was left over in um, requested capitals from this current fiscal year, correct? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So that's actually the DW Field Trust. Okay. Um, so Councilor, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're going to take a recess. We seem to have lost our live, feeds, live feed. Sorry, Superintendent. We're reconvening from recess. I do apologize for anyone that's watching. We did lose internet and um, there was an outage in the area. So that's why we um, 
lost the signal, but now we are back at, um, in our budget hearings, and we have in front of us our superintendent of parks, Mr. Um, Timothy Carpenter. So good evening again, Mr. Carpenter, and I, I don't think what you said before was recorded because I was told that the signal was lost right when uh, Mr. Tataglia from licensing uh, was before us, so the chairperson of licensing board. Um, so, Councilor Mendez, do you want to re-ask your question? Yes. So my question was regarding the um, revenue that we had for one hundred thirty-nine thousand and six hundred six hundred dollars. So that is um, revenue from the DW Field Trust. Um, that you know, in these sort of difficult times, I have specific line items within the budget um, that are specific to the park, and the trust is able to be used for care, maintenance, and improvements to the park. Um, so in order to, you know, working with the mayor and the CFO, um, we came up with this sort of creative strategy to utilize some of the proceeds that the park department receives from the interest payments from the trust to um, offset sort of general fund requirements uh, to specific line items within the budget. And uh, mainly I was also wanting to know regarding the golf course, the club. So what is the income that we get as a city from that and also the effects of being closed for all the COVID-19 months, how does it affect? So I'm very proud to say that last golf season was the highest um, revenue producing golf season in the history of the golf course. We did just over $1.1 million. Um, so current fiscal year deposits, uh, to the city are just over a million dollars. I think it's a million eighteen thousand, somewhere in there. Um, and to be honest, Councillor, um, the effect of closing the golf course has been difficult. Um, you know, it's the restrictions put in place, the initial 15-minute splits between tee times. Um, you know. We operated last season at eight minute splits between tee times and the state mandated 15 minute splits. You cut your business in half, essentially. Um, so single rider carts is another issue where, you know, a cart might cost, each seat is $20, we're now doing a single rider cart for $25. Um, you're using just as much gas, doing just as much damage, um, just as much wear and tear on the carts. It has been a challenge. The state is now down to allowing us to 12 minute splits, um, which gives us an extra tea time an hour. The state also mandated initially that they were requiring online payment. So we weren't able to take payment in person in the pro shop. Um, an interesting experiment that was, I'll be honest with you, um, because what we found was there were, because people had prepaid essentially for their round, somebody paid for a foursome, they were bringing four people. Um, there weren't as many cancellations. Um, and the other thing that we found through this whole thing is that times that the course was generally not occupied, generally speaking between two and 4.30, it was real easy to get on the golf course last year as a walk-on. Um, you know, it was before the league started and after sort of the retirees had sort of played through and. Um, so those hours were, were generally not utilized uh, as much. And what we found uh, to this point is those tee times are absolute, we are running foursomes from opening to close. So I am excited to say that at this point, we are actually only about $21,000 behind where we were at this point last year. With all the restrictions, um, I think nationwide, statistics show there's been a huge surge in people wanting to play golf and it's going to die down and then we already have seen that it is starting to so that number will never catch last year and i expect to be conservative i expect at least probably a 35 to 40 percent loss from last year okay. um, especially <coughs> if things don't change in terms of restrictions uh through the state but at this point I'm, I can't believe where we are at at this point uh, in the season. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Thompson. 
Good evening, Mr. Carpenter. Good evening. Um, so I, you and me spoke a little earlier in this year uh, regarding the new grass field at the O'Donnell Field. Yep. Uh, can you tell me about that? Uh, I know you, I believe at that time we were talking there would be some construction beginning in <coughs> June. Is that pushed off? It is a little bit slower uh, than we would like. Uh, the engineering firm that we were working with was working from home. Things. We are probably ready to have bid documents out by the middle of July. So I'm hoping shovels in the ground probably late to mid-August. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, Little League Baseball. Um, are we going to be able to start that up this year, and wh what's the status of that? The uh, mayor's office, myself, and the Little Leagues have had multiple phone calls, Zoom meetings, whatever <coughs> that, that we have going these days, um, in regards to that. So under phase two, um, youth, uh, youth sports are allowed to practice. Baseball is considered a contact sport. So, um, so under phase two, uh, the leagues are allowed to practice. No games, no tournaments, no inter-squad scrimmages, uh, no more than 12 people in a group, uh, including the coaches at one time, unless they're separated by, you could have two groups of 12, as long as they're separated by I think it's 40 feet. Um, so we are working with the Little Leagues right now to get permits out to them, um, providing them with the guidelines. Uh, we do ask that they provide us with the sanitation plan so that any shared equipment uh, we, uh, they understand needs to be sanitized between use. Um, any benches that kids may be sitting on, obviously the kids need to be separated, spaced out wearing masks if they can't. Um, so we, were, we are requiring a sanitation plan. Um, so it's, it's much different than it has been in years past, um, but yes, we are moving forward with allowing practices for Little Leagues. Is there a projected uh, like opening, opening day where they can actually play ball? <clears throat> uh, so, at, you know, in terms of games? Yes. There's, I think there's a possibility in phase three um, but I'm not positive that those regulations haven't been released. Um, so there might be a possibility in phase three, which I believe is about a week and a half away or so. Um, but as of right now, the little leagues here in the city are just sort of getting going. Now, what about their snack shacks? Um, I know what uh, down have to stay closed completely Yep. because that's a big revenue earner for the baseball leagues. It's unfortunate, but it's sort of shared food. Uh, so it will not be allowed, I don't believe. Understood. Um, also, has, are you aware, I, I got a phone call um, about a, uh, from a Mr. Uh, Shields, well, um, uh, the guy behind MRI Shields, um, and he stated that he was looking to make a, a million dollar donation for a um, artificial turf uh, behind our known school. Um, have you been in contact with him about this uh, Donation? Uh, the gentleman you need to speak to actually was speaking before you earlier tonight, Superintendent Thomas. E.B. Keith Field, which is the name of that field, the Parks Department, by the, by the will and the trust that it left to the city, has no care and control of that property. It is all school department. Understood. All right, uh, that's all I have, Madam President. Thank you. Okay, counselors. Any other questions for uh, Councilor Nicastro? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. You too. Um, I had a question on your financial overview on page 349, and down at the bottom it talks about indirect costs, about $439,000, and I just wondered, what is that? Sure. Okay. Go for it. Yes, Mr. CFO, of course. Uh, do you, let's have yeah. Matteo. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, to answer the counselor's question, if you recall last night when we were discussing water and sewer, uh, I spoke of uh, a study that the, the city did and hired a consultant 
who has an expertise in this area that looked at all of our enterprise funds and did an analysis of the administrative contribution that those enterprises should be making back to the city. So this 438,000 represents uh, the sum total of the administrative support that the city provides to that enterprise and is getting reimbursed for. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Claxton. Mr. Carpenter, I have another question for you. <clears throat> I sat in on a Shannon Grant call today and was very inspired listening to how all these different um, nonprofits that get funding from the Shannon Grant to work with children are planning virtual and also on site um, programs f to keep kids busy this summer. And one of them mentioned that they had a call in to you to be able to use one of the parks um, for a couple of hours a day. And I wondered, I didn't recall what the park rules are. Is that possible? So um, under the governor's order right now, the largest group can be 10, and I believe I remember uh, that conversation. Um, so I think the group that they were talking about was a little bit larger than that. Yeah. Um, so under current restrictions, I couldn't permit for a group of over 10. Okay, I'll pass that on. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor, any other council? Councilor Ianeri. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I, I just wanted to uh, take a couple of quick seconds, but I do want to mention, um, I know we have some park work that's going on um, uh, this spring and into the summer, um, and I'm, I'm happy to um, even mention, uh, and um, Mr. Copper and I have met on this, uh, that they host a uh, playground on West Chestnut Street is uh, uh, finally being done. It's being, uh, you know, uh, revised with um, some new equipment for um, for children's swings, et cetera. Also, um, the basketball court uh, area is being taken place, and some of the land was always uneven with tree stumps and whatever. That's all gonna be leveled, and um, uh, if you don't know, I mean, the host of park is also named after um, a Vietnam uh, vet, which was the um, nephew to the, the late Mayor Paul Studinsky. So um, I'm pleased to, um, to have that being done, uh, something that I'd asked when I was council president uh, for Mayor Carpenter to see what we could do, and, and he did do that before um, he passed on. He, uh, we did uh, get the uh, we did get the money uh, last year. I think it was through last year's budget with the help of our state representatives and uh, state senator. Um, and I think there's going to be some work done also with the Hancock. Am I correct? Because right. it was a split split uh, split devil as we call it. So um, I'm I'm happy to have that, and and I think it's um again. Uh, you know, us doing some work um, for these types of playgrounds and, and with the state helping us uh, um, that we're able to get through these things. And, and I, um, I think even the Danny Goodwin uh, playground, is that being done at East Junior High School this year as well? That project has been completed. It's so been completed, so. Uh, play okay. equipment installed down there. It's all done? Okay, great. So I just wanted to point that out and, and then I wanted to thank you for, uh, you know, for what we're doing to get this done. And when we do have it done, we're gonna rededicate the uh, the holster pack, um, you know, in, into uh, um, this individual, um, you know, to his family and all, because um, again, like I said, he was a Vietnam vet. So please, it is being done and um, please, it, we're working on it now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. No problem, Council. And the Danny Goodwin Park looks really nice. I was down there not too long ago and it, it looks nice. It came out beautiful. Council Cruz. Thank you, actually, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, you don't have it listed on your uh, accomplishments, but I know that you've started the last phase of fixing the Bent Playground, which many people in the neighborhood call it the Ash Street Playground, but it's the Harold Bent Playground, yep. named after a former mayor of the city. So, uh, and it's important to get those signs up. I know we're putting the Buckley sign, Playground sign back up. It's important for these kids to know who came before them. And I do want to also give credit where credit's due for the Bent Playground. Councilor Monahan did most of the work on getting that going with you, so thank you for the work at Borders Ward 2 and Ward 1. So I got the credit and he did the work the way it should be, so <laughs> and thank you for that. As usual. So <laughs> thank you for thank you for getting that done. Thank you. All set, Councilors, any other questions for our Superintendent? Then I will ask a few really quick ones. I won't keep you much longer because we have a conversation regularly as DW Fields Park is a large part of Ward 7 and um, it's a jewel in our city and it's used by many of our residents as well as people from out of, out of the city. Um, so we've talked about this often, Councilor Mendez brought it up, keeping the gates 
um, you know, uh, closed for uh, t abiding by the, because it is posted, you know, when the gates can be open and um, when moving vehicles can be in there, but unfortunately sometimes the gates, somebody opens them or they don't end up being closed, so it's a problem for pedestrian, uh, you know, walkers, people that are just enjoying the park, whether they're biking or walking in the park, and it's, um, I know it's been a lot of, on you, and I know we've, you've brought it before the chief, and I know Chief Gomes and yourself have worked closely on it, because the police does regulate closing and opening the gates. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to repeat everything. I know you're doing your best to make sure that that stays regulated, um, but in, in the past, you, were, you had mentioned um, electronic gates, and um, I know they're very costly, but is this something, and then maybe Troy can help us on this, is this something that could be um, funded or reimbursed with the COVID funding because, because due to COVID-19 and social distancing, when you have multiple people, pedestrians are walking in the park, you can't have moving vehicles in there and it's become very difficult to make sure to regulate the closing and opening of the parks. So is that something that could, we could, I know, do you wanna give us a number? I know you didn't have an exact number, Mr. Superintendent, but um, I know it was, uh, it's a little pricey for the elect, um, automatic gates, but it would solve a huge part of our problem, but. Yeah, I think it would be a blessing and a curse. You know, I think, um, you know, you would still have to have probably the police go through to close the park. Um, it would be much easier for, you know, and then they could be on timers to open. So, you know, but I think you would still need to rely on the police to close the park in the evenings. Um, the estimates that I got were anywhere between 55 and $75,000 per gate. Per gate. Well, we need a few, right? Because you have to, you have to make the electrical connections. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine gates. Okay, I'm not a math genius, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Um, but so, what about? So, in any case, even with public safety, if they're on timers, then what if like there were public safety vehicles needed to get in there? That would be a a problem or i'm sure that they come with you know the ones that we were looking at also had a keypad on them so uh, you know public safety could have the code to get in okay i mean i'm just trying to fig figure out solutions and especially we've gotten calls and i know your office gets calls renee gets calls all the time from uh residents who are really concerned about um moving vehicles with you know with bicyclists and um and pedestrians in the park. So I'm just, if there's anything that we can do to really um, work on keeping the gates uh, regularly closed and open when they're supposed to, and um, maybe we could have the, you know, even if we have the police going in there, if there's any violators, maybe actually like fining them or something, just so people will follow the rules inside DW. So we'll work on that offline. I don't wanna hold you up tonight. Yep. But another issue that's, once again, DW is the trash barrels. We have those plastic trash barrels. And I know you're on C-Click Fix and it's been ongoing, but can we invest in some nice trash barrels that are covered and that are maybe nicer looking than those blue barrels? If um, that would, I think, I think DW Fields Park is well deserving of okay. that and, um, Councilor Monahan. Um, so if that's something that we can put in there and maybe include it and in, if we can somehow put it in the budget or COVID-19 because it did all come about with COVID-19. The more people that are in there, the more trash barrels and it's overflowing and it's causing a problem. And with that, thank you. Thank you. All right, have a wonderful evening. All right. Well, I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> oh, that's right, <laughs> I forgot. Um, Madam Clerk. Cemetery, Timothy W. Carpenter, Superintendent. Any questions on cemetery? Council Cruz. Uh, first off, to your crew up there, I know this has been, I've talked to two or three funeral directors in the city and they can't speak highly enough of how much work the crew has done up there through this, uh, the, the amount of work has been just unbelievable. I think it's slowing down finally, but, uh, um, and also, They've had, I know that they've had some complaints about some of the funeral homes not exactly following the rules. Um, 
the rules are starting to change. Uh, are they, or do you still have 10 people at a funeral? Or? As of right now, we are still at a stage where it's 10 people at graveside. Again, gatherings over 10 are, are still restricted. So at graveside, so 10 people out of the car at once, yes. And are you getting cooperation from the funeral directors on that? You know, it is an exceedingly difficult thing to try and tell to a family that's grieving. Um, it really is, and everybody's in a very difficult situation, but I think that the funeral homes um, and the mayor's office, we've had probably at least three or four Zoom calls with the funeral directors, um, and I think the mayor's office and the funeral homes have, have worked well together, you know, with my staff and my department um, in trying to be as sensitive around the issue as possible. And I guess then my only other question, and I ask this most every year, and I never feel good about whether I'm getting a, pro a, a good answer on this, and I don't mean, are we charging as much as we should up there? And I'm not trying to pick on the dead. <laughs> no, I understand. But um, you know, I think the last time I really looked at the pricing was probably about four months ago, five months ago. Um, so, we are still definitely probably the mo the least expensive um, cemetery. Which that's okay as long yeah. as we're not. But we're not, we are, I can say this, we are definitely not thousands of dollars below, um, even multiple hundreds of dollars below most of the other cemeteries. So could we actually, I hadn't had a chance to look at cemetery before I started this, but are we on a, po a plus side on that or are we, can, Troy, maybe you can answer. I don't always read your uh, tables exactly correctly. Are we subsidizing the, the, the cemetery to, to much of a tune? Yes, the entire yeah. thing. The answer to that is yes. Yes, the entire thing. Is way up this year. Yep. But yet <clears throat> the, the revenue, well, a large majority of the revenue that that, that, that particular department creates um, goes into two separate counts. So two thirds of it will go into the perpetual care account, one third goes into sale lots and graves account. So um, the money that we charge for the sale of grave liners does offset what we request in our um, budget line item mm -hmm. for cemetery supplies. But um, for a large majority of the fees that the cemetery brings in, uh, does not cover the, the entire operating cost. And we can we can't get to that. I mean, it's not close enough that we should could get to that. Um, the way the you know the most so for the sale of the lot um, because of the way that's split up, that will always be in in separate accounts. Um, I think you would have to raise fees probably pretty steeply in order to get to that. Okay. I mean, we're not too, too far off, but. Um, Where are we? So far this year. Right, so, so, so far this year, unfortunately. Well, yeah, uh, this year is. Um, right, so I mean, for example, this year we did, as of yesterday, we've done 375 burials, unfortunately, wow. in the city. Mm. Um, you know, during the heat of the, or the height of the pandemic, we did 21 in March, we did 59 burials in April, mm. and we did 70 burials in May. Wow. And the only way that's, po and, and I know, mm. the only way that's possible is really, and I, I didn't get a chance to say in the beginning, but the staff up there, as you said, is uh, exceedingly hardworking. That's what I keep being told, so thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Council. Councilor Ianieri. Just, just one quick question. I know it'll be a quick answer. What, what's the work that's going on in the older <coughs> section up there? So that's an expansion project. That's that, what I thought yep, it was. So it's about two and a half, a little shy of two and a half acres of an expansion project. Um, you know, we are unfortunately quickly running out of space to Melrose. Uh, right. That was one of the few areas left to develop. And that, uh, and that was just old. Helpful. That was just old trees and brush in there, anyways. If right. I can remember, right. so you know, un unutilized. It was called the Grove, um, and uh, so 
I expect that project to be wrapped up probably by the end of July. Okay, so it, it'll hold how many, is that gonna be an area where they're one, two, or still one, two? How, how are we doing that now? Is no, it, we will still be side by side. You are still, we are still side by side up right. there. Okay, because I know a lot of the other cemeteries are where I have mine, it's yep. Pine it's Hill, it's, it's, it's yep. different, yeah, yep. yeah, okay. Uh, but because of the restrictions on the size of equipment that we have, it is safer for us to go side by side. Right, right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Well said, Madam Council. President. Councilor Rodriguez. Well, that was uh, basically my question in terms of the stackable uh, funerals in the sense, but I mean, we've got two things going here. We're running out of space and people are still dying and we need to put these folks somewhere. I mean, some of us are pretty closer to the grave than we are to the crib. Speak for yourself. So um, um, I'm saying what, <laughs> what type of equipment would we need to purchase to make the uh, stackable uh, graves versus just a side by side and, and thus expanding our ability to bury more people? Right, so the, the, the really the biggest issue is um, the equipment is is a relatively it's it's basically an, a backhoe with an extended boom. So that's really what you need. But the issue that we run into is when we're not burying in a new section, when we're burying it, that piece of equipment is too large to get into the way the cemetery was laid out. Very confined areas. So we have to utilize a smaller backhoe. Um, but in the new space, I mean, the new area that you're building, right. constructing, uh, yep. couldn't you look into that since we're rapidly running out of space? Sure, we can look into that. I mean, I, I walk into the cemetery a, a week later, you're in a different zone altogether, you know? Correct, and, and it's, yes, it is scary. Um, over the past four months, how quickly we have um, utilized space in the cemetery. And what are we doing for, let's say, some of the homeless folks that we have in the community that pass that are without insurance, without family, what do we do with them? So uh, there's an organization, and I believe the gentleman is out of Winchester, that um, actually works with um, local funeral homes to deal with that type of situation. No, I'm talking about from the, funer from the cemetery standpoint. Okay. So from the cemetery standpoint, we don't have any more, um, in section Z, we don't have any more space down there. So, so we, would have to, we would have to find a creative space somewhere within the cemetery to start being able to deal with that again. So what do you do when somebody shows up and a homeless person with no family passes? What do you, what again, do you end up doing? oftentimes that person is generally cremated um, and then it's, it's obviously less space. So at that point it's a little bit easier. So you still have those, uh, that opportunity anyways. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other councilors have any questions? <coughs> With no further questions, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number 13. 12. Planner, Robert May, Director. Good evening, Mr. May. Glad to see you're still here. I thought you might have left the building. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, Councilors. Uh, my colleagues out in the hall waiting have asked me to not do my regular you know, big Busby Berkeley production number, so I'll, I'll keep the it council brief. Council asked that too. Your, your yeah, friends in you here so. also. <laughs> we have had a very busy year. Um, we have projects going on in almost every ward. Uh, we project a, uh, a very busy um, next fiscal year as well. And um, we thought that uh, the coronavirus would have slowed down development projects in the city. Um, we have lost a few leads, but that doesn't mean the business is slowed down at all. Uh, we're just as busy. Uh, fortunately, we're able to work um, away from the office. We have the technology to portal into our um, desktop computers here at City Hall and uh, through Zoom and other technological advances, we're able to communicate with the developers and with the constituents throughout the city. So I'm here to take any questions regarding the budget. 
Any questions? Council Cardoso. Hi, Rob. Hey. I just want to thank you for all your support during this time for our small businesses and for answering all of our questions and helping with constituent concerns. I think you've been fabulous. And I just wanted to thank you for that. That's it. Thank you, Madam Prime. Any other councillors have any comments or questions for Mr. May? Oh, I can take my mask off. Well, yes, you can take your mask off. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, Madam. I'm shave, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's it on that I on conservation. Um, Madam Clerk, number 14. 13. Conservation Commission. Robert May, Director. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening. Councillor Mendez. Hello. So the beginning of this year, I went to a meeting for the conservation. Um, and one of the things that we were working on at that time was the updating the plan for 2020 to 2020. What's the status of that and after the pandemic hit? So how is that coming along? Uh, what the council is referring to is that we are in the process of updating our open space and recreation plan, which is a requirement of the state. We have to do that every five years. Um, and uh, the councilor is uh, representing um, a, a group of constituents, but more importantly, um, bo both city council and um, uh, you know, folks at large um, as we update this plan. Now, unfortunately, when the coronavirus hit, um, we weren't able to do the outreach and the public meetings that they were planning. Um, we now are, um, you know, working on Zoom uh, in public meetings. Uh, it's not the best way to to reach constituents, but it is a way. Um, I think as we enter into stage three and stage four, we'll be able to have a lot uh, more public meetings with more people involved, at least more than 10. Um, so I anticipate that that'll be picking up in, this, in the fall. We want to have a really robust plan and that really requires getting deep into the community to understand what their needs are with regards to parks and recreational facilities and making sure that we have that uh, documented because once that's documented, that allows us to then apply for um, state funds through a park grant program, P-A-R-C, and um, we've been able to utilize those funds to make improvements in several of our parks so far in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors have questions? Councillor Nicastro. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, Thanks Councilor. for waiting. I think we're here for the night. <laughs> um, I noticed, well, earlier this evening, Mr. Tartaglia came in and spoke to us as chair of the License Commission. And I noticed that you're speaking on behalf of the Conservation Commission and the planning. To, and I the will planning comment board. on that. That was a decision that was made by myself. Um, I felt that a lot of the boards are volunteers. And in past years, we've had uh, questions why the, you know, sometimes the chairs of the boards did not come before us. And as this is Mr. May's department that um, that ha that actually I you present the budget. It's not the chairperson. So that is the reason I made that decision because the person that's presenting the budget should be the person to be able to answer on it. And the chair people usually they're just they're volunteers and they're the the volunteers on the boards. I also made that decision with licensing, but Mr. Tataglia still ch chose to come before us instead of Sylvia, who actually presents the budget. So I, I'm just to answer your question, that decision was made by myself and I, in speaking with our auditor when we were putting together this agenda. So, and Mr. May um, was very, uh, agreed to it and said he had no problem coming before us, even though in past years it's been the uh, chair people that have come before us. Okay. Okay. So, so see, you didn't even have to answer. So I didn't, I, that's because I, I, I take full responsibility for that. That was something that we decided, and I know since I've been on the council many years, um, you know, volunteers on boards sat here all night waiting, or sometimes they didn't, they didn't show up. Or, and um, it was, you know, it's very important that we have the people that are presenting these budgets that are able to answer the councilors. Any other questions, Council Thompson? Uh, were you all done, Councillor? I apologize. You were all done? Okay. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Mr. Good evening, May. Sir. 
Um, just, just to go on back to the planning and economic, and I promise I'll make it quick. Um, you know, Rob, you and me have been working uh, closely together over the past uh, few months as downtown uh, Ward 5 covers half of the downtown, yes. and uh, we have the Crystals, the, the Crystals Block Project together. We have the, um, the CSX, uh, CS, well, the Trout Brook um, Urban Renewal uh, Project going. So um, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with you over the last six months, and I'll say there's no harder worker uh, in uh, City Hall than, than you, well, I would say you're an extremely hard worker, and, and I think we need to get you some help in that planning office. Um, I know uh, prior to the hiring freeze, uh, you were in the, um, you, you were looking for a planner, and um, uh, how far were you along in that process? Well, um, prior to COVID, we had hoped to actually expand the department by bringing on a couple more people doing very specific economic development and, and planning tasks. And that obviously went away. Um, I think we will be, it, it's in our budget. We hope to um, start uh, the interviewing process in a couple of weeks and bring on a uh, planner one, uh, which would replace Shane O'Brien who left uh, for the city of Everett. Okay, um, and, and hopefully you do find that help because uh, I, I know you guys are doing a lot of work in that planning uh, office and, and, and the more help would uh, help alleviate uh, some of the hard work that you're doing. So uh, w the city appreciates everything you're doing and um, thank you, sir. No more. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions for Mr. May? Oh. Madam Clerk, number um, 14. 14. Planning Board, Robert May, Director. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you again for uh, agreeing to come in and present these. My us. pleasure. Councilors, any, any questions? Councilor Fowell. Just a, just a comment, and I, and I understand the conference between you and, and uh, the auditor and Mr. May, but if nothing else, having the chair people come before us, they conduct the meetings on a regular basis. They know the different activities that go on. <clears throat> they may have some recommendations that they'd want to pass on to us. And if nothing else, the 11 of us could say thank you for volunteering your service and your time. So next year as a council, maybe we can all get together and come up with a game plan for, uh, you know, with a, with a unified. Sure, I don't disagree with you, Councillor. If, if I could finish. Sure. Maybe we could come up with a unified plan as to how we want to proceed with budget hearings, and if it's the will of the majority, you don't want these people here, uh, that's fine. But, but I think we ought to discuss it as a body and then decide whether we want them here or not, because frankly, I'd like to say thank you to them. Well, I, I think you just did. So I think if they're watching at home, they, you ju they just heard you, thank you. But the decision that helped, the reason I made this decision is because of the past seven budgets that I've been here, I remember um, Councillor, actually at the time, now Mayor, Councillor Sullivan being up here and being very furious because some of these board members did not come before us be, uh, and to present the budget and that was what helped me make this decision and that's why I discussed it with the auditor who actually, all I did was plan, th these are already, the department and the department heads are already planned, we just put them in the order of who's coming in. The only changes were the boards and it's, it was due to the fact that um, when now Mayor Sullivan was council president, he was, he, um, you know, made the comments that a lot of times these board members did not come before us. So that's, and that's. I, I respect your decision. Yes. I would just say that if someone can't carve out one night a week when they sure. have the honor of serving us, then maybe that's a problem. That's well, a problem. Maybe it is, that, but I took into consideration that they're volunteers, whereas we have our department head who actually plans the budget, and if we have questions, we can ask Mr. May. But thank you again, Mr. May. Councilors, do you have any questions for Mr. May before, uh, on this budget item? No? Councilors? Well, thank you, Mr. May, and have a wonderful evening. My colleagues in the hall, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk, number 15. Treasurer Collector, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer Tax Collector. Good evening, Mr. Brophy. Good evening, Councillors. Do you have a statement or? Um, as I say most years, um, every dollar of this budget 
comes through my two offices. Um, it's either coming in or going out the door. So that's, uh, I personally want to thank my staff. It's been a, a difficult year, obviously, but uh, they've done a great job. Thank you. Councilors, any questions for our treasurer? No questions for the treasurer. Council, help, thumbs up from Councilor Rodriguez. That's, that's it. Well, a thumbs up is great. <laughs> that's quick. So, um, Madam Clerk, number 16. Treasurer's Debt Service, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector. Good evening again. Evening. Councilors, questions on this line item for Treasurer's Debt Services? Councillor Rodriguez is giving thumbs up. Keep paying the bills, that's all it's. Councillor Ianeri, you have, you have the floor. I don't have my thumbs up. I was just gonna say thank you for your services being our treasurer for so many years and doing an outstanding job with your staff because it means a lot and, and you're right. Everything goes through your office and it, it all goes out in the wash in a certain way, but I do appreciate all that you do doing any time that uh, I have to reach you're always there for uh, you're available and, and always answer my questions. So I appreciate that. So there's my thumb up. Thank all you. right, thank you. Any other questions, counselors or comments? No. Nope. So I will just bring up a couple of things. Thank you for your service. Um, I know that residents have contacted us with the uncertainty of when City Hall is going to reopen. The majority, I mean, I was here the other day, the majority, there was a few people that were trying to come in that like to pay their bills here. I know I've had constituents. So I know you've been, you've tried to be accommodating. I know a gentleman in my ward that wanted to pay his excise tax, you were able to take, um, you know, I delivered the envelope to City Hall, but can we, I don't know how long City Hall is going to stay closed. Can we do some sort of a kiosk? I know that there are the, <laughs> but if somebody wants to pay cash or wants to actually hand you their envelope, is there anything we can do? Um, actually, usually the security people go to the door. Um, yes. Cash, the problem is we don't actually have the cash draws out, um, so it would have to be exact change to pay a bill. Um, <clears throat> that's the hard part. Um, normally, you'd get a receipt with that. Again, you know, we're just not, you, we don't have the foot traffic coming in the door. Um, Usually what we're asking people to do is we've got, it's actually the library's book return out in the, yes. the back of the hall. Um, online, we've waived the fees during all of this, so um, we're kind of asking people more to try and do it online or a check. So I, I have gotten complaints from constituents who, and who have tried to pay them online and still got charged the fees, so how are you, are you dealing, helping those? That, or? It, I mean, that, and then one of the ladies. It all depends because okay. if they go through the deputy collector's website, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. if it's a past due bill on excise, that's a different site. It's a different company. Uh, if they go through the city's website, there are no fees. Charged. There are no fees. Okay, yes. I'll make sure I let yeah. them know. Uh, perfect. Well, uh, Councilor Cruz. I don't want to let my constituent leave that easily. <laughs> uh, just kind of a quick question. So I, debt service is down. Mm -hmm. Nine percent is what we're looking at, meaning we'll pay out about 9% less? Yeah, what happened is it was um, one of the school construction loans, which was one of the ones where the state made you borrow the full amount and then reimbursed you every year the 90% of your payment. Uh, that loan finished. So it was always in there at the full amount, but the money was almost a million a year, I believe, wasn't it, Troy? Almost a million a year that would come in from the MSBA to pay the 90% portion. That's off the books. It's paid in full. So that was a drop in over a million dollars right there. And there was a small other group, uh, I think about five or six other loans that uh, completed, and those came off the books. And are we in pretty good shape if we need to go out to bond on anything? Uh, yes, we actually did just did a uh, bond anticipation note uh, for a little over 5.3 million, and the, the rate of the return was fantastic, actually. So our rating's good and- Yes, and rating's good. Um, but the city is still in a strong financial position. So we have a huge bar in capacity um, because a lot of the water and sewer debt is considered, since it's paid by an enterprise fund, it's considered outside the city's limit. So it, it doesn't even count for your bar in capacity. So we do have good, yes. good capacity. That's what I wanted to know. But you always have to pay those bills. Yes. <laughs> pay those first, like your mortgage, no matter what, you got to pay that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, thank you. I just wanted to know why that was down some. Thank you. 
No further questions? Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number 17. Human Resources, Sandra Knight, Director. Good evening, Madam Director, how are you? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I didn't have anything officially prepared. Um, Fine. Um, Councilors, do you have questions for our um, Director, Human Resource Director? I'll give them a few minutes. Councilor Cruz. Uh, I guess just a quick question on, <coughs> excuse me, I know we are in a basically a hiring freeze, but mm -hmm. we did approve two new positions as part of the settlement for the for the Lopes case, yes. have you started the process of filling those two positions? Yes, we posted out? the positions, I believe, two days ago, two or three days ago. So they're up and on the website right now. So they are. Mm -hmm. So they're posted for, not filled yet. You no, just, not filled yet, just posted. Just, yes. just posted. Okay. Both of those positions? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and you don't expect any trouble filling those? I'm hoping we don't run into any. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other councilors have questions for Councilor Mendez? Hello. Hi. Is that the reason why the um, personal services non-overtime is has increased so much? Is that because of the two new positions for the Lopes case? So now it's budgeted for this year, 434,000. Is that, that's, that's what I think? Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. All set, Councilor? Yeah, all set, yeah. thank you. Any other questions for human resources? Council, any other councils that haven't asked any questions yet? No? Okay, Council Cruz, you have the floor. Under purchase of services, last year was 53,000. It's up to 208,000. Is that to do with with uh, the studies from the Lopes case? So what's, what is the purchase of services? Yes. It's just, it's a big jump, I just, if you look uh, on page 123, <clears throat> under uh, consultants, that goes from 34,000 to about 189,000. And you're correct, Councilor, that includes $150,000 in mandated training as part of the Lopes settlement. Okay. So that's 150, but it's 208. Do you know what the rest is? On so, page 121, purchase of services is 208. Right, the total under purchase of services is 208. If you go to page 123, then it, then it, it provides the rest of those numbers. So the uh, department rental and lease is, is uh, consistent at 4,500. Uh, advertising we reduced from 7,000 to 5,000. Printing was reduced. Mm -hmm. And then uh, regular training, that's outside the Lopes case, that's citywide training, was increased by $2,500. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Also, Councilor, Councilor Mendez. Yes, and this question is probably also for the <laughs> CFO. The separation cost to for, um, this budget, it has increased from zero to 150,000. I can answer that one as well because that was something that we added in there. Uh, although this budget right now doesn't anticipate any layoffs, should the situation become more dire and we need to lay people off, we wanted to have a buffer in there to pay separation costs. So it's really an insurance policy that's in there. We hope to not have to use that and it'll either be available for other uses uh, or can be returned at the end of the year as free cash, but that's just an insurance policy. Okay, thank you. That was it. Thank you. Any other questions for human resources? Oh, that was easy. All right, thank you so much. Thank have you. a good evening, Madam Director. Madam Clerk, number 18. Law, Megan Bridges, Assistant City Solicitor. Hello. Good evening, how Attorney are you? Bridges. How, how are you? I have a short statement, if that's all right. Of course. So I was just hoping to give a short overview of the law department. We're a fairly small department and we do a lot of work. 
Um, the people in our department are Attorney Karen Fisher, Attorney Aileen Bartlett, myself, Megan Bridges, Attorney Brittany Bly, <clears throat> um, Mary Milligan is our paralegal, Cynthia Oliver is our administrative assistant, formerly the principal clerk, and Michelle Yaffe is our workers' compensation agent. The license commission also falls under law, but you already heard from them. Um, and basically, we handle any claim um, that the city that is brought against the city or the city needs to make. We deal with litigation, we deal with labor and employment matters, and we deal with public records requests, collective bargaining, IMAs, managing city insurance policies, quality of life, receivership, um, government services, reviewing contracts, open meeting law questions, working with departments to buy property. Uh, we often assist HR in their endeavors, um, license to carry appeals, buildable lot determinations, dealing with city owned real property, um, the License Commission and the workers' comp folks uh, fall under law. And so our office doesn't provide legal advice to the public, but we do provide legal advice to all of the city's um, boards, departments, commissions, sometimes to the council, certainly the mayor's office. Um, and I think that's a pretty general overview. The budget, as you see in front of you, is for the most part level. Um, <clears throat> the increase Admittedly, I did not put this together, but I have reviewed it thoroughly. So the major increase I could see is the 21% in the goods and supplies on 135, page 135, and that correlates specifically to um, monies, $20,000 exactly for training and continuing education for the lawyers in our office, which um, I support um, as needed. That's something that we don't normally do, but um, in treating the law department like a true law firm and handling the things that we do in-house, uh, the training I think is necessary. Other than that, I don't see any increases in our budget. Thank you. Um, oh, two hands <laughs> popped up at the same time. So how about ladies first this evening, Councilor Council Castro? Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bridges, for being here. You've got personal services known over time that has increased 400, almost $433,000. Does that include for outside counsel? So actually, that it's a little bit of um, the way the visual is out is a dis discrepancy. We had employee transitions in FY20, so that is the difference there. No one's making more money. It was actually, if you look at FY20, excuse me, FY19 expended on 135, it's fairly similar to FY21 proposed. I think the exception is one of the um, part-time assistants. So not all of our personal services money was spent this year because of the composition of the department. Um, I'm sorry, it might be the late hour, but I'm not quite following you. It's gone up so much. It's, so if you're comparing 19 to 21 it it really hasn't it's that in 20 we had so in 20 you you had fewer people yes okay i do understand them thank you thank you madam president you're welcome counselor ianeri thank you madam president good evening attorney bridges how are you good how are you sir good and i am um, i'm not trying to put uh, you on any type of a spot, but um, um, I think it's the first time in 17 years when I haven't seen anybody sitting in the in the full-time city solicitor uh, position. So I'm just wondering, uh, is the mayor, or is there thoughts about somebody that's going to be there or an interim? Or um, I know you you people running the show in there, and that you know um, I appreciate that, and everything's getting done. I'm just wondering about that, like that position, and what you know the time frame may be with the the filling of that, or nothing's been mentioned yet. Uh, well, certainly our office is, works collaboratively and well, and um, I, I've heard from multiple folks it's, you know, a law department that's been re that's respected in the city, and um, in terms of the search for the solicitor, I understand that it's ongoing, but I would have to defer to the mayor on any comments on the subject. Okay. All right. That, that's fine. I just, I was just wondering where, where we're at with that, but that, that's probably something that, um, you know, a, a council will probably ask the mayor, but just just for my own interest, and people ask every time when you're out and about, just you know when someone's going to be filling that position. So, 
Sorry to put you on the spot, but no, you know, that, that's why we're here. You're, you're here with the budget, so there you go. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All set, Councillor. I am. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Fowler. Yeah, just, just as a point of information on the issue that was raised by uh, Councillor Ian Erie, the city solicitor is appointed by the mayor, not with any confirmation by us. So that basically means it's a two-year position. One cannot assume that you would either be retained by the next mayor, nor can you assume that the current mayor who appointed you would be reelected. That would be very presumptuous. So I've actually spoken to the mayor about this, and the problem is residency. There are many qualified people who would like to do it, but they're reluctant to transplant their family from another community and move here, knowing that, well, now we only have 18 months left in, in the mayor's current term. So it may be that, and it might be me, I may propose an ordinance amendment regarding residency in the city solicitor because this body, before most of us were elected, has already exempted all assistant city solicitors. They do not have to comply with residency. They can come from anywhere, be appointed as an assistant city solicitor, live wherever they want. There's no minimum residency requirement for seven years, as we have with some collective bargaining agreements. And obviously, that has helped us recruit assistant city solicitors who are highly competent. But the residency is the hang up for the city solicitor. And that, that's really something that, uh, you know, where we, we, we we this body has exempted all of the other legal talent. Uh, I, I just think if we're going to get a qualified city solicitor who has the degree of expertise on a wide range of subjects under the law, which you need to know for, for municipal work, uh, that might be a discussion to be had on a future date if an ordinance amendment is proposed. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Councilor Mendez. Hi. So just to continue a little bit on, on that subject, because I do think it's very important. I do agree with uh, Council Farwell that we should waive the residency requirements so that way we could fill that position. But as of today, so who is in charge of the law department um, today? We work cooperatively, so I believe the ordinance states that any one of the assistants steps in the shoes of the solicitor when she or he is absent, and um, that's been the case so far. So, um, you know, the mayor has authority <coughs> over signing of contracts and settlement matters. Um, so, in you know, in terms of a boss, we manage ourselves. Maybe they should appoint you as the acting city solicitor, at least so that it would because I see you all the time representing the legal department. So at least we would have someone that could um, call in and answer the questions. But thank you for stepping up and, and being over there and doing a great job. I personally, just as a matter of personal privilege, love my work here. I like municipal law a lot, and I'm available whenever you all you know, need anyone. The office has sort of naturally divided itself up into um, divisions such that Attorney Fisher handles a lot of the labor work. So does Attorney Bartlett and Bly and myself, but um, Attorney Bartlett handles a lot of litigation. I handle a lot of the government matters. So that's sort of maybe why you see me more than the other folks, um, but that's just kind of a natural consequence of how the office is divided up. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Okay, Council. Any, uh, uh, Council Cruz. Thank you. Um, what Councilor Fowell had to say, I, I wouldn't have a problem necessarily. I think it's a conversation we are going to have to have because I, I think it's wonderful to say what you just said about working collaboratively, but my guess is if some department came to you for advice and said, we'll just re run it ourselves, you would probably give legal advice to say that's a recipe for disaster, is my guess. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but Maybe if they weren't all lawyers, I don't know. Well, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're now 25% into the mayor's term, and uh, people are saying, well, do they actually need another, do they need a full-time? I've had some people say that. I know wh what goes on in, in our uh, law department. We do need that person, but we're 25% of the way through, through Mayor Sullivan's term, and it's not filled. It's a little tough to say to, to people, yeah, it ha we have to have that person, uh, but somebody has to be the boss. Uh, you know, right now, maybe working that you're all, but you're talking about the work 
that you each have areas of expertise. That's not management. We, I mean, we certainly provide that aspect too. Our department functions. We've been open the whole time. You know, um, we get correspondence from every direction of the city, and it has to be managed and delved out. You know, I don't think our department has a reputation for not getting. Back oh no, I'm not. Uh, no, I'm not casting so aspersions that way at all. What I'm saying it is, somebody has to be the boss. I, I and agree. Let's be honest, you essentially have been the boss. I agree we need a boss. Yes. So you, you basically are the acting city solicitor without the title right now. I would not agree. Okay, well. I would not agree. Karen and Aileen, you know, Brittany's part-time, but Karen and Aileen and I, no one rules about the other. I just, I, I, we do need to talk to the mayor. It, it needs to get filled, and, and it's, uh, it, it, it can lead to some issues. With, especially with outside, probably with outside council, and it's a great staff there. It has been for a long time, and uh, but there's a reason there's a there's a boss, and it needs to be filled. And if we need to do something about residency, I don't disagree with what Councilor Fowell has, has had to say. Then maybe we need to look at that. But it is something the mayor needs to. And it, the COVID has changed everything. We know that, but. Um, in fact, even right now, there are probably questions that have come up and there are people who think that the city can't do a lot of the things that the mayor has said we're doing. And somebody needs to be there and be the boss. So and I, you're doing a great job of it. And I know you don't want the job from what I've been told, but the mayor needs to fill that spot. If he needs help from us, we need to do it. So thank you. Councils, any other councils have any statements or questions? Well, then I will put my two cents in. Thank you, you've been very helpful. I know every time I've reached out, you've been able to answer our questions, especially with legal matters regarding our meetings. I know we have attorney Resnick that represents us, but I, I've reached out to you numerous times with uh, issues that we're dealing with as a city council, and I appreciate um, your being available to us and your colleagues. Yes, they are available to us. I, I will make just a quick statement. I, I agree with, I don't, agree with my colleagues as far as getting rid of residency because I think Brockton has a lot of talented attorneys. I just think maybe the appointment part of it being appointed just, it becomes very political. So maybe take the politics out of it, but not the residency because I'm all about that. So uh, thank you again. And I think that unless you have something to state, do you? No, I mean, you know, the residency issue is within the purview of you all as a body. Um, I would state that our department is a 10 member department and um, everyone except two people live in the city of Brockton that work in our department. Aileen and I both bought homes in the city because, you know, Councilor Farwell's point is absolutely correct that our department's exempt from the ordinancy, or excuse me, the residency ordinance, but um, I know most of us don't view it like, like that. Um, so, but the, the, I enjoy working for you all, with you all, and look forward to continue doing so. Thank you, yeah. have a wonderful yeah. evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number 19, which is an uh, auditor, which is yourself, I will, if you can please go to the podium. Well, good evening, Madam Auditor. So I'm gonna make a brief statement based on a few things that were said tonight by um, Mayor Rodriguez, Councilor Lally, and Superintendent Mike Thomas. And then I'll briefly talk about my budget. So I always speak from the heart, and then I back it up with facts and figures. I try to be as honest as possible when I'm up here in this role. Reading some of the public statements earlier tonight really affected me because I too want to see more representatives that look like me. I've been here for nine years, and some of you may not know this, but I was the first black female department head in the city, and it was in 122 years. That's a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. We have 26 department heads. Of them, 21 are male, one is a black man, five, as of last month, um, with the new interim Board of Health Director, are um, females, and two are black, so out of 26. I would love it if the city took the initiative to hire more people of color in high executive positions because there are many qualified candidates out there and representation matters. 
That being said, I'm gonna move on to my budget. So most of my budget was cut, but there are three groupings that were increased and I will talk about them. Okay. So first, overtime. So it was increased from $3,246 in fiscal year 19 to 9,500 in fiscal year 20 and 21. And the reason is because there's an employee who works in the finance office who works half time in my office on the accounts payable side. It was anticipated that she would retire this year, but that did not happen. In anticipation of her retirement th this upcoming year, I'm requesting that we ask for the same amount. Um, these funds will support any extra work that two of the staff members who currently work on AP will be able to do while we wait for a new position in my office to be budgeted for to take on all the AP work, well, in addition to what we already do. Number two, personal services non-overtime. That was increased from $495,003 in fiscal year 19 to $570,082 because I hired a compliance technical and quality control administrator who, among other things, assists me in providing policies and processes to comply with new accounting standards, assists me in preparing and presenting financial reports, and ensures compliance and implementation of new rulings and guidance from GAP, GASB, and FASB. Andrew Nocon is an actuary, which is an asset to my department because he's well suited to conduct really thorough data analysis and data mining in MUNIS, which is our accounting system. This also allows him to provide insight into our health insurance trends and reserve levels. I also hired a junior clerk who assists part-time with AP. Taylor Bennett started out as an intern and was promoted to this position part-time because of her hard work and commitment. She is a testament to her generation. For fiscal year 21, my PS non-OT increased by $6,468 to cover step raises. And lastly, Goods and supplies. Goods and supplies was lowered in fiscal year 19 because in, two, in fiscal year 20, the budget was increased to accommodate for increases in office supplies. As there is more staff, more supplies are needed. Also to accommodate increases in, in and out of state travel costs related to registration for auditing conventions, memberships into the auditing and accounting organizations, munis classes, and state, local, and federal auditing and financial agency classes. Fiscal year 21 has an increase in registration and membership to cover these agency fees increases and also to cover the cost of my compliance officer's yearly actuary license membership and other classes that we will need to remain compliant with GASB and FASB guidelines. And that's it. Thank you. Um, and first off, thank you uh, for all you do for us. You're our, you and your office are our clerk for the finance for our, for our meetings, so thank you for uh, for working with us. Uh, Councillor Ian Airy. Wait, I gotta take my napkin off here. <laughs> thank you, Madam President, and um, thank you, Mel. I, I do wanna thank you for all that you do for us as the city auditor in, in every such way, and I, I wanna thank you for um, the way that we've been working together, and we, we do have to have a meeting soon on the accounts committee, but you know, you've always been there and always um, uh, brought to the table any and all information that that, that committees look for at any given time. So I do appreciate all that you do. Um, appreciate you being here. Um, uh, I, I would hope that, um, you know, you're here for, you know, a, a next man as well, which is something that needs to be discussed with uh, the person in the corner office to be truthful with you. So I'll openly admit that, um, and you know how I feel about that. So um, I, I think at this point we need to really find out you know, where that uh, reappointment is because you should be there. And that's my personal opinion. And if mm -hmm. some have others, uh, other thoughts about it, well, that's their thoughts to have. But um, I still think you've always done a great job since you've been here and appreciate everything you do. And uh, you can go home now because I'd like to go over <laughs> home myself. You know, I'm always, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Okay, counselors, any questions for our auditor? Councilor uh, Cardoso. Hi, Mel. Hi. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for those words. This is a tough time. It's very emotional. It's hard hearing um, the um, public comments. Um, so I hear you. I feel you. Um, and just a quick question on your cuts. Is there anything that was cut that's like really? The only thing is um, if you look at auditor telephone. And the reason why is because um, when I oversee the telephone, it's all the landlines. 
and sometimes um, different um, areas need to get new telephone systems. So for the, it's this year, we had to pay about $10,000 for Board of Health to get an increase, and we needed it. I mean, COVID-19 was here, what are we gonna do? And I was really sad because I could not pay for an increase, um, I'm sorry, um, um, new phones for um, Montauk Road, for DPW, because mm -hmm. I didn't have enough funding. Right now, I've already spent about $67,000 for this fiscal year, and I have not paid the bills for June yet. So I might be coming to you guys next year, probably in July or August, letting you know, listen, I need to pay fiscal year 20 bills in fiscal 21 because I didn't have enough funding. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Thanks for the good work and for Thank always you. being there and answering my questions. Always. Thank you. Uh, do you have a question, Council Power? Oops. It's getting late. We're almost out of here. We're almost out. At least they won't fog up when they're in my lap. Uh, I said this last year and I'm going to say it again. Most important office in the city. Half a billion dollars goes through your office has to be accounted for meticulously with state oversight and in uh, and to comport with our uh, mass finance laws. So uh, great staff, great job, and it, it really, I hope people remember that. Half a billion dollars goes through your office, and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors, for the auditor? With no other questions, then Madam Auditor, number 20, Auditor Mail Room, Marilyn Peters, True City Auditor. So this went down. Um, it was for postage. Uh, this year, we did not spend as much on postage, obviously, because COVID-19, there weren't as many offices, you know, moving grooving, so our amounts went down. Um, let's hope it stays there so that the cut doesn't affect us this fiscal year, upcoming fiscal year. Councilors, any questions for Auditor Mail Room? No questions? Okay, we'll move on to item number 21, Auditor Telephone, Marilyn Peters True, City Auditor. So this one I mentioned a little bit earlier, to Tina, um, in terms of my only concern is that um, it, it's pretty costly and, and Verizon's never cheap, it never goes down, always goes up, so that's my only concern, but I will always come back to you next fiscal year to ask for more funding. Any questions, counselors? Councilor Nicastro. Thank you. Mel, good evening. Your preface was very well said, and and I think we'll all take it to heart. And um, I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Is that can, any other councils have any questions? No, nope, no questions. Uh, item number 22: Retirement, non-contributory. Mary Lynn Peters, True City Auditor. So this budget is for that one member who, I love her spirit, she's still here with us. Um, and the reason why fiscal year 21 is more than fiscal year 20 is because it also includes a potential COLA that she would receive as a retiree. Any questions, counselors? Well, chance this will be the last year, the last couple of years. <laughs> this has been a bigger budget every year. I know, down down. it's true, it's true. Just for the public to know, this is people who are on the retirement system when we seize to fund it ourselves. That's right. So, there's one left, huh? One left. <laughs> I won't ask. Cooper, I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No questions? Well, thank you. So you can come back to your seat. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Madam um, Clerk, please read number 23. Finance, Troy B.G. Clarkson, CFO. Good evening, Mr. CFO. Thank you for being here with us both nights. They've been long nights, but I know we condensed them. Um, instead of having three nights, we have two nights. And thank you for, I know they're a little long and you have a long ride. I believe you have the longest ride home, so I apologize. Um, before we start, I just want to compliment you on the budget books. Thank you. The, it's, 
like reading a story, and it's really they. It really is um, nicely put together, and so thank you for all your hard work on putting together the budget for us. Um, do you have a statement? I'm figuring. Just very briefly, yes, Madam President. Thank you, and thank you for those kind words. And as I said in my submission letter to you, uh, that was a true team effort. Uh, the, uh, the the leadership of the mayor's office was key in supporting us and putting this budget document together. My team two members of which are actually seated outside and have been the last two nights, uh, Karen Praval and, and Tipsy Asulo, who are uh, indispensable. Uh, Kerry Richards, the chief of staff in the mayor's office, was by our side helping put this together. Uh, and, and our former CFO, Jay Condon, was a great resource as well with his experience and wisdom. So it really was a great team effort, and you're right, uh, a budget tells a story, and, and this budget tells the story of this community and what we value. Um, and, and so uh, I, I hope you find it useful. It is posted on the website for those watching at home. Uh, we do have extra copies that we've made, and, uh, and if you, you want extras or have people that, uh, that would like them, we'll be happy to provide them to you. Just a couple of quick thoughts uh, as a follow-on to the mayor's introduction from last night before we get to the specific finance budget. Um, as we end fiscal year 20, it's important uh, in this uncertain uh, time to, to note that we have been tracking this year's revenues very, very closely on a weekly basis. Uh, and uh, our local receipts are actually, uh, we project them, as you know, very conservatively this year uh, and in this budget for next year. Uh, despite that, we are, uh, we're at 90% right now. So despite the, the catastrophic impacts of COVID on our economy, uh, our tax collections and our local receipts in general, uh, because we forecast them very conservatively, are still coming in quite strong. Uh, it's a critical fact, I think, in constructing this budget. It was a priority for both the mayor and me to keep our stabilization fund and our Chapter 324 stabilization intact. There was a time, as we were putting this together, where there was so much uncertainty about uh, the potential for state aid, we actually looked into uh, mm -hmm. tapping into the Chapter 324 stabilization. We looked into deficit financing. Uh, and a whole host of uh, solutions to try to get us to where we are tonight with minimal impacts. But we've been able to work closely, as you've heard time and time again, with the school department and with the superintendent and Aldo Petronio to get us to where we are. Uh, this is, however, not the end of uh, our uncertainty. And we'll be back before you a year from now, uh, perhaps with a situation as or more dire. So it's important that you understand that we, we will, and, and as I do, we'll keep you informed throughout the year so that we understand we're planning, we're playing the long game here and trying to make sure that the city is stable financially in the long run and not just for this one year. Um, and finally, we are working closely uh, with the folks at Plymouth County, and I speak uh, on a regular basis both with uh, the chair of the county commissioners and the county treasurer uh, to make sure that we're that the city is in a good position. One of the challenges for the way the regulations were written uh, by the federal government and that the county uh, mirrored those regulations is that we are reimbursed for expenses. Mm -hmm. But we've set up a communication so that uh, some of the issues that were discussed tonight, some of the, uh, the, the ideas that were raised, so we're asking those questions before we make the expense mm -hmm. so that we're certain um, that, uh, that the expense will be approved. Uh, and, and so there's, uh, I do expect in the next day or so they will come out with the allotment for the second phase. In that first phase, we were allotted $4 million. Uh, we haven't spent all of that, but that will carry through to the next phase, and I anticipate that that will be much more than that, and that we will be in the 10 to $12 million range, which gives us some pretty significant flexibility for some of the potential improvements uh, and expenditures that the school department talked about. So I'll, uh, I'm at all your FinCom meetings, so we can talk about this regularly, but I thought those facts in particular were important to, uh, to discuss with you.
I'm happy to answer any questions in general on our revenues. I know it's late, uh, or on how we put this budget together, both uh, in, in the conceptual form and in, in its physical form here. Uh, but as it relates specifically to my departmental budget, uh, it, 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 like many of the budgets, as you can see, uh, are as it represented by a, a 7% decrease. Uh, most notably, we have a vacant position, as in many departments, uh, that, that was not filled. Um, other expenses remain generally constant, but I'm happy to, to answer any specific questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Claxton. And yes, you're always available for our meetings and even city council meetings you've made. You've always been there for us to answer our questions. So I know I truly appreciate that and I share, I'm sure my colleagues share the same sentiments. Um, thank you very much. So Councilor Cruz, you have a question? Uh, two questions. One is on your budget. Purchase of services, a million and 83,000, whatever. What services generally are you purchasing? So. The bulk of that is under the electricity power. One of uh, those solar agreements that the city made before my arrival uh, is funded and operated through my office and mostly in this line. So that makes up just shy of 900,000 of that million. Uh, the, the rest of it is uh, $4,000 for our, our copy machine. Uh, we have requested for an increase in printing costs uh, primarily to be able to continue to do things like produce this budget. And then a general consultant line, uh, we hire from time to time consultants, uh, the one that I've mentioned to you uh, that, uh, that did the analysis of our indirects for the enterprises. The city for many years has had a consultant that assists with um, getting Medicare reimbursements that's paid through this line. Uh, we have a consultant that assists us with uh, uh, our insurance portfolio. Uh, that's paid out of here, so th there's lots of different uses for that. So that electricity power we purchase, we actually, we actually get money back for it. Yes. So you, it's being purchased out of, out of here. But, but the money also comes back, yes. It's back to us. Uh, okay, th thank you for that. And then my other question is basically about the CARES Act money. So. You're pre-asking in some cases, who's making that decision at the county? Whether, when you ask whether this is gonna fly. They have uh, a team of people that they've assembled. Uh, so they have hired uh, a law firm with experience in municipal matters, Murphy, Hesse, oh, Toomey, and Lane. Murphy, Hesse. Um, they have hired a municipal mm -hmm. auditor, uh, Melanson Heath, that has broad experience in, in municipal government. Uh, they also have uh, an accountant, a municipal accountant that they have on retainer who is actually reviewing the applications. Uh, so I believe when we ask those questions, they fan it out to whomever on the team. Uh, I generally, I would think the, the attorney. I can tell you internally, before we ask the question or submit a reimbursement, we also review it internally with our legal team. And, and Megan and I have been in constant contact. Uh, that I understand. Has there been anything that they said they wouldn't reimburse? Not thus far. Um, because clearly, you know, there was a lot of controversy at the time, and we were told, some of us who talked to the county commissioners, that it was gonna be the absolute best thing for Brockton, that they handle that money and not the state. So if there's any hesitation on anything that we should be, I, I hope you would reach out to all of us and let us politically speak to the county commissioners because we were promised by them that it was better for the city of Brockton if they handled this this fund and that we would be not we would be getting more than anybody else in the county and we certainly have been affected by COVID much more than any other town in the county. So if there's any hesitation, I expect to hear and we will I I don't want to speak for my fellow councillors, but there were many of us involved at the time with questioning that decision and we want to make sure that that the promises that were made to us are held up by the county commissioners. I will most assuredly let you know uh, this, the program actually runs through December. Uh, so we, I will gladly provide regular updates at your finance committee Chief meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Fowler. Councilor Cruz asked, answered, asked and my question was answered. So I would just say to you, thank you very much for all your work on the budget. And please thank the young ladies who you've had 
sitting out on a hard wooden bench for the last four hours. Even with my padding, I don't believe I could put up with that. So maybe lunch in the office for them at some time might be appropriate. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. Uh, yes. I think I bought lunch today, but uh, well, but I times glad. two. <laughs> All right, that's Thank a deal. You, uh, <laughs> take it out of your budget. Don't worry. About All set, Council. <laughs> Council Cardoso. Hi. Good evening, Troy. It's been a long one. Um, I was going to ask the same question, uh, Tim. How aggressive are we being in getting some of that reimbursement, and how much pushback are we getting from them? But I guess you answered that, and you know we're all watching, you know, to make sure that we're getting the most that we, you know, what we deserve. The other thing I wanted to mention to you is that, it, being a new counselor, this has been really tough for me, um, trying to understand all of, you know, the budget. Um, we were hit with COVID-19, so that didn't help at all. Um, when we first started, I know you and the mayor put together a nice orientation. And that was great to kind of help us out. But then no sooner did we start, the COVID-19 hit us. Um, so it's been, it's been hard for us to access department heads and ask all the questions that we wanted to ask leading up to this. Not making excuses, but just for the public to know that as a new counselor, I could speak for myself and I'm sure my fellow new counselors feel the same, that this happened very quickly for us and didn't give us an opportunity to really, you know, dig into a lot of this stuff. So we're hoping to continue to learn and to do good by our, you know, residents. And we appreciate the help that you have been able to give us um, and, you know, just hoping to continue to, to do our due diligence and to look through some of this stuff. But it has not been easy, I can tell you, um, speaking for myself, so thank Well, you. thank you, and, and indeed, we, we hope that that the, the new format of this document uh, makes it easier uh, for new and veteran counselors alike, and particularly members of the public, to really understand the numbers behind the numbers. The president and I have chatted several times uh, since, uh, since she was elected president, and, and we would, uh, not to put words in your mouth, Madam President, but we would like to use those finance committee meetings as teachable moments as well. And so, I'm happy to set aside time at those meetings when we have the time to really talk in a broader sense about the finances of the city and how the budgets are constructed. And we, uh, we will continue to track revenue lately, uh, re regularly. And so we really want to be uh, not only reactive uh, to the issues of the day, but proactive in terms of helping you understand more deeply this half a billion dollar operation. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Councilor Mendez. Thank you so much for everything, all the work you put in uh, in making this budget, in especially with the hypothetical numbers, because I think that was the hardest part. And just continue on with um, Councilor Cardozo was saying. Um, I myself and I believe all of the other councilors received several emails from the public asking us to defund the police department and put that money towards someplace else. And I think that is a, a misconception that the public has, that we have that power. In reality, we really don't. So i like you to just, as a new counselor, as if you're like instructing me, but this is mainly for imp informational purposes only, because I had that conversation with you and you explained it to me, but I just wanted to make it clear what exactly our power is when it comes to the budget, and uh, when we make the cuts, where does that money go to and who has access to reallocate those funds to perhaps use it someplace else? Just to clarify a little bit more for all the people that are wondering. Thank you. Sure. Great, great question, actually. Thank you. So uh, <coughs> the construction of the budget, the numbers within the budget, uh, and the spending priorities are set by the executive, the mayor. The mayor submits his budget to the legislative branch, all of you. And again, it's a policy statement of what's important uh, to, the, to the city. You then have the opportunity to review that. Uh, and should you agree, pass it in its entirety. Or if you choose, uh, as those of you that have been here for a while know, uh, make adjustments to that. 
But uh, Councilor Mendez makes a very good point, and, and as those who have been here for a while know, your ability uh, in reviewing the budget is to either pass it its, in its entirety or make reductions, uh, but not to add uh, to the different departments. So if you make reductions, that money uh, is still available, and it's actually called, depending on the time of year, uh, available funds. So for instance, last year, uh, reductions during these hearings, reductions were made in the law department. Uh, and those, that money was available to then be submitted by the mayor as an amendment to the budget to increase it in, in other areas. I do anticipate, uh, as we discussed briefly last night, that should the, the Commonwealth, the legislature produce a local aid package that's more generous than what we have anticipated, then the mayor will file an amendment to this budget, increasing uh, a variety of departments, perhaps, for some of the positions that are here in the budget but not funded uh, for some of the, the the cuts that were necessary to be made. Uh, and, and so you will then have the opportunity to either accept those or to, to make further reductions. Uh, so that, that really the process uh, is the check and balance between the executive and the legislative branch of, of local government. Thank you. And what's our free cash and when does it, that gets determined? That's a great question as well. So free cash uh, is neither free nor is it truly cash. Uh, it's sort of a misnomer, but the state at the end of every year, at, on June 30th, so here in a couple of weeks, uh, the city takes a snapshot of its cash position. And generally, free cash is made up primarily of two things. And it's revenues in excess of projections and it's budgeted funds unspent. So if we don't spend money that you appropriate during the fiscal year, or we get revenues in excess of what we projected, that becomes the baseline for free cash. Um, if there, then there are other factors. If there are, uh, if we have, if the state has provided us money and we haven't filed in time for reimbursement for it, things like that, those all get reduced from free cash. If we've uh, spent in excess of a line that we weren't supposed to without the permission of the state, that hits against free cash. So, but it, at its basic form, it's made up of those two things. So that is why when I talk to you about how we conservatively estimate our revenues, why that's so critically important. Because communities have gotten in trouble in the past by creating a budget and then estimating revenues to meet their spending. That's a recipe for disaster. So what I have traditionally done in my career and what I know my predecessor did here was the opposite. To estimate your revenues very conservatively, generally what we do is we take the actual revenues from a year and try to project the following year's local receipts at no more than 80 or 85 percent of the previous year's actuals. So you're always building up some free cash. Because Brockton has struggled financially historically, we traditionally here use the entirety of the free cash. So when that amount gets certified by the state, usually in the fall. We've had to then use that to balance the budget the following year. And in fact, this budget that's before you is balanced with approximately $14 million in free cash. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to get to a point where we would be able to keep some of that free cash uh, and then we could use it uh, capital purposes and not have to borrow. So that's, I think, part of a long-term plan. Certainly with the conditions that we're in right now, we're in no position to talk about not using free cash because we had to balance the budget, you know, by transferring money into stabilization. Uh, but I think it's an important goal to have, to try to wean ourselves uh, off, off of that use. So uh, it's a, free cash is a critical part of our budget here and in every community in the Commonwealth. Uh, and it, it's, uh, I, I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you, thank you. All set, Councilor, any other questions? Councilor Nicastro. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Thank you for being here. I know you have a long ride ahead of you. Um, I'm looking at page 117 and the list of your employees. And I notice you're paying $54,600 for part-time but it doesn't say for who. That uh, money is generally 
uh, and we haven't used anywhere near that, but that's what we use to pay JCon in the form of CFO. Okay. And does he b bill based on time spent? Yes. Yes. Yeah, not a regular salary. So uh, I, I think the amount this year is, I, I don't even want to speculate, but it's, it's far less than that. Okay. Uh, so if, if we need him for an hour or two, he bills only for the time used. Okay. So did we use all of that money last year or in the current year? No, no, no. So far this year, we've used uh, 38,356, and that's as of this week. And what is his hourly? $60 an hour. So that annualizes out to about 120,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. All set, Councilors. Any other Councilors have any questions? Uh, Councilor Ian Airy. No, not so much a question. I, I, I just want to take time to uh, thank uh, Mr. Clarkson for all that he's done, and uh, especially with this uh, new format of the budget book, uh, because it's something really different from what I've had in all the many years. I've, I've done the budget a little bit more easy to even read and even understand, so I appreciate that. And, and of course, I appreciate your staff and what they do, and uh, they being here both these nights with you to, uh, to help you and to help out there, I think, uh, you know, means an awful lot as well. Um, I, I just want you to just to do one little thing as I asked you earlier and um, just so counselors know um, I did talk to uh, Senator Brady this morning in regards to the uh, situation with the uh, um, senior center at Mary Kennedy Senior Center and uh, I know Mr. Clarks has been in contact with the state and uh, hopefully that we can um, keep our eyes on that and see what we can do to make sure that we can at least get that ball rolling for them. Um, and I know Senator Crete, or Senator, excuse me, Senator Buck, yeah, Senator Brady called me back and indicated that um, he had um, already talked to, um, you know, Al in his office and we wanted to get it moving. So I just wanna, I just wanna keep it moving. I know it's on a small take, but we need to be doing something for them. And I really, uh, I, I'd appreciate that if we can keep it going, right? Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Yes, indeed, absolutely. And it, it's unfortunate that the, the Commonwealth was inflexible uh, and, and not allowing uh, an extension on that because Janice and her team in the building committee, in fact, with uh, the support of some folks here in, in this building, uh, have moved that project forward. And it, it, it did have some, some delays, but it, it's moving forward. And so the, the Commonwealth's unwillingness to provide just a short extension so that we could complete that is, is very frustrating. So, But, but we'll, we can work it at our, our we'll, end if we have to to, to yeah. get them to get them rolling because I, I, I think, you know, I think we should. And, and uh, as I indicated to you before, I was unaware even when I mentioned to you about um, the, the uh, you know, the, uh, I almost called it the doghouse, but I just did. But I mean, the new facility on, on Court Street being built and not realizing that last year we gave them money to, to begin that project and I didn't realize it at all. But if we can do that, I think we can also help them to get, to get going because it, it all comes back into the city. It's all, all togetherness, I guess. So I know I know you do it, and I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. All set, counselors. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Clarkson. Thank you. Um, that concludes our hearings. But uh, bear with me two minutes, counselors. We're going to go over um, just a few things. So um, just for some of the new counselors, I know this was a new process for you. It was a Little different, it was different for some of us that have been here a little, a little bit longer. But in past years, we've always received the budget books, and a week later, we've had the budget hearings, kind of similar to what happened this year. So it's always been the case. So if we, you know, I think if we want in future years our future counselors to have the budget book a lot sooner, that's something that would probably be discussed. But I remember in the years that I've been on, it's been probably no more than a week that we've had them before we've had our budget hearings. We did, I did condense uh, into two nights instead of three to due to the fact that three nights, um, we, we'd have to open up City Hall since it's close to the public. And that way we'd have to restart everything all over. I figured two nights would be, a, a, 
a little painful, but at least uh, we wouldn't have to come back a third night. Um, so tomorrow is our uh, city council meeting. You have all received these sheets. They were with your agenda yesterday at your desks. So tomorrow city council meeting is via Zoom because we had to schedule it in advance. It was announced that it was Zoom. Uh, if you have deductions, as uh, uh, Mr. Clarkson stated, the city council, uh, we can make deduct um, reductions, but we can't add or move funds. So that's, um, if you are planning on making deduct, uh, reductions, you just fill out the forms. Please get them to our attorney, Shannon Resnick, uh, whether you scan them or take a picture of them and text them to her. If you don't have her cell phone number, please ask me and we'll make sure to get them to her because she's the one that will read them tomorrow during our city council meetings. Um, during city council meetings. So that's how that process, as far as reductions are made. That'll be done tomorrow night, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, we'll be live on uh, live stream YouTube or cable. And um, I apologize, I didn't have anything to do with the outage, uh, but I apologize for the outage earlier this evening, but cable did say that they will repost uh, post whatever was missed live that was uh, recorded. Um, I don't have any, uh, there is one thing that I do want everybody to, before we end tonight, there was one resident that had sent their um, comment via email, via letter downstairs, and I think they uh, posted it on social media. So I am going to read it just really quickly, two minutes, and um, it, you're free to, um, to listen if you'd like, but it's it's um, Jed Resco, Center Street, Brockton, as a taxpayer and parent of three black and brown children, I challenge the council and the mayor's office to make a more serious attempt toward relocating funding from away policing to education and human services. Whenever more funding is sought for a public need, the response is often to agree in principle, but then say now isn't the right time. I know that with the effect of the pandemic on revenues, many in City Hall are saying just that. However, I say that now is the perfect time to transfer resources away from policing. As you know, dozens of positions in Brockton Public Schools are slated for layoffs as well as vacant positions that will not be filled. Help fund some of that gap by reducing the police overtime budget significantly significantly. It makes sense financially to do this now. It is more fair. If we all have to tighten our belts, why should the students of Brockton bear the brunt of cuts? Now is obviously also the time to relocate resources away from policing because of the political moment we are in nationally following the murders of George Floyd. As a society, as elected officials, we can't say this time we're going to do things differently and then not actually do anything differently. I had to read this gentleman's email because he stated he posted it everywhere. And I know I was shuffling up here, but I couldn't find his letter, but I know it, it came in in the pack as well as the emails, but I'm not, I tried to keep track of everything, so I apologize. But with that being said, if there's no further business before us this evening, this meeting's adjourned.